Okay. The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Good morning, uh, everybody. Um, I welcome everyone to this, which is the 23rd public hearing of the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability. Uh, this is a five day hearing and we're at the International Convention Centre in Sydney. And uh, during this hearing, we will be examining the experiences of people with disability and their families who live in a uh, who uh, have the services of a service provider, Australian Foundation for Disability, known as Afford. This is the fourth of a series of public hearings in which the Royal Commission uh, has and will forensically examine case studies arising out of the uh, activities and practices of particular service providers. At the outset, we wish to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which my colleagues and I are sitting today. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And we also pay our respects to all First Nations people who are attending the hearing in person today, as well as those who are following the hearing on the live stream. As anyone who has been following the work of the Royal Commission will know, our program of public hearings has been severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The restrictions on movement associated with the pandemic and the continuing spread of the infection most recently affecting uh, staff uh, attending a hearing in Hobart held in late March. All these things have forced us to conduct hearings remotely. And in some cases, we've been forced to postpone scheduled hearings. As I've said on a number of occasions, this has created formidable challenges for the Royal Commission, uh, but they have been met by dint of extraordinary efforts on the part of council assisting all branches of the Royal Commission as well as the other agencies whose contributions are necessary for the successful conduct of hearings. In a sense, therefore, today marks a special occasion because this public hearing in Sydney is actually open to members of the public and I welcome everybody who has come to uh, the hearing today. We have three commissioners, as you can see, present in person, and um, we have uh, witnesses and council assisting will also participate in person. The Royal Commission has not been able to hold a hearing of this kind since public hearing 13, which took place between the 24th and the 28th of May 2021 at Homebush, also in New South Wales. It's therefore been 11 months and 19 days since this Royal Commission has held a public hearing in the fullest sense. We sincerely hope that the remainder of the Royal Commission's public hearings scheduled for 2022 can be conducted in this way. And the schedule for the rest of the year can be found on the Royal Commission's website. At this hearing, I'm joined by Commissioner Alastair McEwen, AM, uh, and Commissioner Barbara Bennett, PSM. I shall shortly take appearances from Council assisting the Royal Commission and parties given leave to appear. As I mentioned, this is the fourth in a series of what we describe as forensic hearings examining the actions, policies and processes of particular service providers. Public hearing 13 examined how our service provider, Sunnyfield, delivered NDIS funded services to its clients, its handling of legitimate complaints made on behalf of residents of Sunnyfield's disability accommodation and issues relating to Sunnyfield's governance. The Commissioner's report on Public Hearing 13 has now been published and it is available on the website. The report makes 24 findings about Sunnyfield's conduct, practices and procedures, and also makes some recommendations directed specifically to Sunnyfield. <coughs> Public Hearing 14 was held in Adelaide between 7 and 11 June 2021. It heard evidence about the responses of the NDIA, the National Disability Insurance Agency, the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission and the South Australian Department of Human Services to two independent reports, which examined the circumstances leading up to the tragic death of Ms. Anne-Marie Smith, a death which rightly received a great deal of public attention 
and aroused very deep community concern. Public Hearing 14 also examined the responses of the South Australian Department of Human Services to a threat of harm that had been uh, sent by letter to a person with disability and actual harm that was perpetrated on another resident, both of whom were people with it, or are people with intellectual disability. And this happened in, in disability accommodation operated by the department. A commissioner's report on public hearing 14 will be published in the near future. Public hearing 20, which was held virtually between 7 and 14 December 2021 in Sydney, examined the policies, processes and conduct of life without barriers. A registered NDIS provider whose activities include operating group homes. That hearing addressed whether life without barriers gave effect to a resident's basic human right to engage in intimate human relationships. It addressed the adequacy of life without barriers responses to sexual violence perpetrated against a resident and also its responses to resident on resident violence at a group home. The hearing considered also the compatibility of residents living in the same group home and the choice and control that was available to them in relation to the residents with whom they were to live. A commissioner's report on public hearing 20 will be published in due course. The terms of reference, uh, as many of you will appreciate, require the Royal Commission to focus on systemic issues which are informed by individual experiences. We must inquire into how institutions should prevent people with disability from experiencing all forms of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation, in all settings and contexts. The terms of reference further direct the Royal Commission to inquire into the critical role that carers play in providing care and support to people with disability, and to have regard to examples of best practice and innovative modes of, pre of preventing, reporting, investigating, or responding to violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation of people with disability. As I have noted at uh, the other public forensic hearings, the significance of a forensic examination of the conduct and practices of particular service providers goes well beyond in holding the particular service provider accountable, should the evidence justify such a finding, for failing to prevent violence against and abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability to whom that service provider provides services or accommodation. The underlying purpose of these hearings is to identify and address the systemic issues that demand reforms to enhance the safety, health and well-being of people with disability and to prevent them from experiencing violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation. This public hearing will examine the provision of support, support services by Afford to people with intellectual disability during the period 2018 to 2021. The evidence will concentrate on Afford's daycare program, particularly on a program conducted at Mount Druitt. Among other things, the evidence will examine the experiences several, of several people with intellectual disability uh, who were subject uh, to abuse by a support worker. That support worker was subsequently convicted of a criminal offence and sentenced to imprisonment. The evidence will also address a series of important systemic issues concerning affords governance, staffing arrangements, culture, systems for reporting and responding to incidents, and its approach to communicating with clients and families involved in its day programs. The Royal Commission will hear, subject to any uh, contrary uh, uh, updates from uh, Mr. Griffin, from 10 witnesses, five witnesses will give evidence of the experience of people with disability in a group home run by a Ford and will appear in person, and one will give evidence via audio visual link. The Registrar of the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission will give evidence in person, and three witnesses from a Ford will also give evidence in person. Mr. Griffin uh, FC, Senior Counsel assisting the Royal Commission, will shortly provide more details on the scope and purpose of the hearing, the themes to be interrogated and the evidence to be presented. Mr. Griffin will also provide more details about Afford. I only want to mention that uh, the history of Afford fits into a pattern with which we have become familiar. It was established in 1952 as a charity under the name of the Poliomyelitis Society of Australia. 
making it one of the oldest uh, disability service providers in the country. Like other service providers, which began life as charitable organizations, Afford has become a very large organization and, a grown, and has grown especially since uh, the rollout of the NDIS. To illustrate the point, according to its latest financial report, Afford had revenue in 2020-2021 of $145.6 million, more than triple its revenue in 2013-2014. By 2019-2020, the proportion of Afford's revenue derived from the NDIS was 49%, compared with 17% in 2016-17. Afford's clients base has increased dramatically, from 425 in 2014-15 to 6,781 in 2020-21. It has become apparent at other hearings that the transition from a relatively small charitable organization to a much larger organization providing services that are meant to be person-centered, but providing those services on a commercial basis presents very considerable challenges for service providers like Afford, Sunnyfield and Life Without Barriers. These challenges raise systemic issues of great importance to the health, safety and well-being of people with disability. I shall now take appearances. Chair and Commissioners, my name is Patrick Griffin. I appear with Catherine Gleeson and Ben Fogarty as counsel assisting this inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Yes. Is there an appearance? Yes. May it please the Commission, my name is Ms. Munro and I appear on behalf of the Commonwealth. Yes, thank you, Ms. Munro. I might take the appearance for a forward next. Commissioners, my name's Watson, and together with Ms. Liu, we would seek your leave to appear for a forward. I'm also joined at the table by Ms Lyons and Mr O'Kane, solicitors who are briefing us. Yes, thank you, Mr Watson. I think leave has been granted to afford to appear at the hearing, so that leave is, has been granted to you. Thank you. I was having that say. Thank you very much. Uh, the State of New South Wales. Oh, nobody from the State of New South Wales. Um, I understand that there are representatives from three of the witnesses so perhaps starting with the, the, the witness who will go under the name of Susie. The Commission pleases my name is Brennan and I appear for the witness known as Susie. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. The witness known as Diane. Commissioners O'Brien is my name, I appear for Diane. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. I hope you can find a place to sit that is a little closer to the action, as it were. Uh, the uh, witness known as uh, Sally. Is there an appearance for Sally? All right, well, that, that appearance may be taken uh, later. Is there any other appearance to be announced? If not, thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Griff. Thank you, Chair. Royal Commissioners, we also acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting today. We pay our respects to First Nations elders, past, present and emerging as well as First Nations people following this public hearing. Before addressing the issues to be explored in this hearing, I must warn people watching or listening that I am about to refer to incidents of violence against and abuse of people with disability. The Royal Commission encourages people who may be distressed to seek support. A slide will now appear on screen with relevant contact numbers if assistance is required. Commissioners, this is the fourth public hearing to examine issues of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability who are receiving services from a disability service provider. Like the previous three service provider hearings, public hearings 13, 14 and 20. This hearing will focus on a particular disability service provider. That provider is the Australian Foundation for Disability, commonly referred to as AFORD. Today, you will hear evidence about the experiences of three young people with disability, all of whom received services from AFORD in periods between 2014 and 2021. 
Two of those young people were abused by an afford worker in the course of receiving those services. In addition to hearing evidence about this abuse and how afford responded to it, we will examine a number of issues and themes. Some are similar to those which were discussed in the three previous service provider hearings. But for example, we shall consider six particular areas. Firstly, how afford structure, governance, framework and organisational culture affected the safety and quality of the services it provided. Secondly, afford systems and procedures for identifying, recording and responding to incidents and for responding to complaints, including incidents and complaints concerning potential violence, abuse and neglect and how those systems and procedures operated in practice. And thirdly, the extent to which Afford communicated and worked together with families of the people with disability to whom it provided services, endeavouring to ensure the best possible support was provided in the safest environment. And fourthly, the adequacy of the training and support given to Afford frontline staff so that they could do their jobs in a safe environment and to the best of their abilities. And fifthly, how the funding of disability services through the National Disability Insurance Scheme, NDIS, can impact the service and supports provided to people with disability who have high support needs. And finally, the role played by NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission in the oversight of disability service providers such as Afford. This hearing will also have some differences from the three previous service provider hearings. First, the focus of much of the hearing will be on what are commonly referred to as day programs, rather than on group homes and other types of accommodation services discussed previously. This introduces some different terminology and particular issues connected with funding, which I'll address shortly. Secondly, you will hear evidence throughout the hearing about the rapid growth strategy pursued and indeed achieved by Afford from 2015 to 2021. And we will examine the impact of that strategy on the safety and quality of services being provided. And thirdly, you'll hear evidence from former Afford staff two of whom provided direct support to people with disability participating in its day programs. This evidence will raise issues concerning how Afford recruited, trained and promoted staff about the challenges faced by its frontline workers and about the impact of those challenges. Let me first deal with the Afford and its day programs. As mentioned, Afford began operated in the early 1950s in Northern Sydney, when its name was the Polyomyelitis Society of Australia. For the next 67 years, it remained a New South Wales based disability service provider until its expansion into Queensland and Victoria in 2018, following the introduction of the NDIS. As I have noted, there will be witness and documentary evidence about the tremendous growth of Afford over the past seven years in many ways outlined by the chair a moment ago. From the financial year 2014 to 2015 to the financial year 2020-21, its revenue increased from 45.7 million to 145.6 million. The numbers of people with disability to whom it provided services also grew from 425 in 2014-15 to 6,281 in 2021. The service provided by Afford includes supported accommodation services, that is group homes and respite, NDIS support coordination, disability employment services and day programs. Commissioners, Afford describes its day programs as, quote, hubs 
unquote, where programs are specially tailored for people with moderate to severe disability to enjoy an inclusive and engaging environment whilst building their confidence and social skills. Currently, those hubs are referred to by Afford as, and I quote, lifestyle centres, unquote. You will hear evidence on Wednesday from Afford Executive Manager of Lifestyle Centres, Mr. Wayne Adamson. We will use the term day program throughout this hearing to refer to the services and supports provided by Afford to participants, both at its lifestyle centres and during outings and activities in the community. You will hear evidence that people with disability can participate in activities at or through a day program for one or more days per week, generally between the hours of 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. According to its website, Afford now operates 28 day programs in New South Wales, eight in Queensland, three in Victoria, three in Western Australia, and two in South Australia. You'll hear evidence from the parents of three young men with disability who participated in the Afford Day Program at Mount Druid in New South Wales. You'll also hear evidence from two former staff members who worked at that day program. The support workers at Afford's day programs are referred to as lifestyle assistants and senior lifestyle assistants. In addition, each Afford day program has one or more team leaders who are responsible for the operation of that day program. Several day programs are then grouped by geographical area under the responsibility of an Afford district manager. Commissioners, in the course of preparing for this hearing, we have heard about numerous Afford lifestyle assistants, senior lifestyle assistants, team leaders and other staff who have provided and continue to provide excellent support to people with disability. We take this opportunity to acknowledge their skill and their dedication. Can I now deal with the Mount Druid program and the abuse by a worker called Daniel Namali. Commissioners, the starting point of this hearing is the Mount Druid Day Program and the experiences of three young men with disability who participated in that program. We've assigned the pseudonyms Jason, Toby and Simon to those young men and each of their mothers will give evidence later today. As will be familiar to those following the work of the Royal Commission of each of our hearings, we take a trauma-informed approach to the presentation of evidence. This includes respecting the choices of people with disability concerning their participation in the hearing process. For this and other reasons, we will not be hearing evidence directly from Jason, Toby and Simon themselves. Instead, we'll be presenting evidence from members of their families. <coughs> In order to protect Jason, Toby and Simon's identities, we've also given pseudonyms to those witnesses. Jason's mother, Sally, will be our first witness. Her evidence will be followed by the evidence from Simon's mother, Lily. Lily will appear via video link. Finally, today we'll hear from Toby's mother, Susie, who will be accompanied by Toby's father, Rob. Both Jason and Toby were among several people with disability who were abused by the former Afford lifestyle assistant, Daniel Namali, in 2019. Daniel Namali was arrested in May 2020 by New South Wales Police and charged with a number of offences. The evidence against him was found on his telephone where he had recorded images and videos, including images and videos of Jason, Toby, and other participants in the Mount Druid Day program. Those videos were recorded over several months in the second half of 2019. 
commissioners, we will not be showing any of the videos or images in the course of this hearing, nor putting them into evidence before you for reasons which will become apparent. It is important, however, for you to understand the nature of the abuse perpetrated by Daniel Namali against Jason Toby and the other people with disability that I've referred to. Again, I would like to warn those following the hearing that they may find matters I would describe distressing. Mr. Namali was employed as a casual lifestyle assistant by a Ford in June 2019 at the Mount Druid Day program. Among his duties, he provided personal care to participants in the day program, both at their homes in the morning before they went to the day program and in the course of the day. Mr. Namali also drove participants in the day program on outings or to activities and provided support to them both inside the Mount Druid Centre or hub and out in the community. When Mr. Namali's phone was examined by New South Wales Police in early 2020, it was found to contain videos and images recorded during personal care. These include images of people with disability who were naked in the shower, who were using the toilet or having their incontinence aids changed. In addition to recording these intimate images, Mr. Namali also shared some of them with other people. In addition, in one video, Mr. Namali recorded himself inhaling from an e-cigarette, blowing smoke into Jason's face and gently slapping him while in a vehicle. And commissioners, I use the word gently because that was the agreed statement of facts before the court. In April, 2021, Daniel Namali pleaded guilty to a number of offences connected to this abuse. He was sentenced for these and other offences to three and a half years imprisonment with a non-parole period of 18 months. In addition to the abuse of people with disability that was the subject of the criminal charges and convictions, there were additional videos and images on Daniel Namali's phone of conduct which can be characterised as abuse. This includes verbal abuse, and taunting. For example, in some clips, Mr. Namali shows Jason's food brought from McDonald's and tells him he cannot have it, swearing at him in the process. In one video clip, he is seen driving past McDonald's with Jason in the vehicle, taunting and swearing at him and telling him he cannot go in. In several videos, Jason appears distressed. Commissioners, there is no evidence that Daniel Namali's employer, for, Ford, was aware of this abuse of people with disability prior to being uncovered by police. We will be presenting evidence concerning how Ford responded after the abuse was brought to its attention by the police. As I have noted, the abuse by Daniel Namali and its impact on the people with disability concerned and their families is the starting point of this hearing. However, the evidence that we presented is not confined to this particular case study. Each of the witnesses today, Sally, Lily and Susie, will tell the Royal Commission about other issues of concern to them about the manner in which Afford supported Jason, Simon and Toby while they attended the day program. Those issues will also be the subject of evidence before from the two former afford workers tomorrow. Can I deal with the subject of the death of Myrna Apram? Before I give more details about the witness evidence, I need to mention another tragic event which occurred in 2019 and which is referred to in a number of documents as well as by some of the witnesses. Commissioners, on the 23rd of May 2019, a young woman with disability named Myrna Apram died. At the time of her death, Ms. Apram was living in supported accommodation provided by a Ford in Woodbine, New South Wales. 
I understand Ms. Apron's mother, Tanya Petrus, is present today to watch these proceedings. We understand that there is an ongoing inquiry into the causes of Ms. Apron's death, as well as legal proceedings in the federal court brought by the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission against the Ford in relation to it. It's important I mention, Commissioners, that we are constrained by our terms of reference not to prejudice any ongoing legal proceedings in any matter we discuss at a public hearing. For these reasons, we'll not be presenting evidence on those matters, nor asking you, Commissioners, to make any findings with respect to the circumstance of Ms. Apram's death. However, there will be evidence about the death of Ms. Apram and the investigations that followed and discussions which were triggered within a forward about the organization's safeguarding systems and processes. In particular, at least one member of the senior executive team and one member of the board began raising the alarm internally about whether a forward was complying with relevance, regulatory frameworks and obligations and had sufficient focus on issues of safe, high quality service provision. And I now outline in broad terms, the evidence to be given by witnesses. Firstly, dealing with Sally. Our first witness is Sally. She is the mother of Jason. She's also his primary carer. Jason is 24 years old and lives at home with his parents in Western Sydney. He's also very close to his sister, Nicola, who I understand is also present today. Jason identifies as a First Nation man. Jason lives with autism and intellectual disability. He's predominantly non-verbal and requires assistance with almost all aspects of daily living and personal care. Jason communicates with gestures, sounds, and some words. He can show when he is frustrated or distressed through his behavior. When Jason finished school in 2016, the NDIS was being introduced. His NDIS plan included funding for, and I quote, core supports, unquote. Sally and other members of Jason's family considered that a day program might suit him and could help to build his independence and communication skills. Because Sally and other members of the family had to work, Jason also required assistance with personal care in the mornings and transport to the day program. Sally will tell you there were several reasons why she chose the day program offered by a Ford at Mount Druitt. She will also tell you that from the outset, she had some concerns about the services a Ford provided to Jason. One of her main concerns was about the lack of communication she received from a Ford, which left her feeling like she knew little about what Jason was doing each day and who he was, who he was with. She'll also describe how the turnover of staff, particularly of team leaders, had a major impact on these communication difficulties. She will say that it seemed as if she only heard from a Ford when Jason had a behaviour and was involved in some kind of incident, meaning he had to be collected by his family. Sally will tell you that she was not sure what behaviour support strategies were being employed by a Ford staff at the day program to assist Jason. In August 2018, she wrote to the then CEO of a Ford to complain about this following an incident which had occurred resulting in Jason being temporarily suspended from the day program. Another issue that Sally will address relates to how a Ford quoted and billed Jason for the day program services. She will describe the invoices she saw as, quote, complicated and difficult to follow, unquote, 
and being issued in a sporadic manner. She had to engage the assistance of a plan manager and later support coordinator. But will say that they also struggled to make sense of these invoices. In addition, Sally will describe how the quotes she was provided from a Ford sometimes exceeded the total amount of funds available under Jason's NDIS plan. She'll say that she felt Jason and other or Ford clients were treated as a number, being the value of their NDIS plans. Sally will also describe what happened when she was informed of the abuse of Jason by Daniel Manali. She will talk about the impact of the abuse on Jason and his whole family. She'll say that they felt completely unsupported by a fraud during and after the criminal justice process, which ensued. Finally, Sally will discuss how Jason has benefited from receiving one-to-one -one support at home following his departure from the Afford Day program in May 2021. Let me now move to the second witness for today, Lily. Lily is the mother of Simon, who is 26 years old. Simon lives with Lily and his father in Western Sydney. He likes being outdoors as well as listening to music and watching movies on his iPad. Simon lives with intellectual disability and autism. He also experiences seizures due to epilepsy. In addition to providing care and support to Simon, Lily worked for many years as a school learning support officer at schools catering for children with disability in the area where she lives. Through her work, Lily knew many of the children with whom Simon went to school, as well as other children with disability in the area who went on to attend day programs offered by a Ford. Simon began attending the Mount Druitt day program in 2014. The first few years, Lily was taking him to and picking him up from the day program each day. She'll tell you her observations from when she was at the day program, both with, with respect to Simon and concerning the supports being provided to the other young people with disability who she knew. Lily will describe her particular concerns about the activities and lack of assistance with skill development that she observed at the day program. She will characterize the day program as my quote, glorified babysitting, unquote. Lee will also tell you that the quality of services provided at the day program varied over time, often depending on the particular term, team leader and staff at any given time. She'll say that she developed a good rapport with some staff and thought some of the team leaders did a great job in the circumstances. She will also talk about the impact of the constant turnover of team leaders at the Mount Druitt Day Program, particularly on communication and on resolving any concerns that she raised. Lily will talk about a complaint she made in July 2019 following an incident with a lifestyle assistant which occurred outside her house. She will describe her efforts to escalate that complaint. Like Sally, Lily will describe concerns she had about the charges billed to Simon for the day program services and transportation. In particular, she will talk about how a Ford told her Simon needed to receive one-to-one -one support, but she had no way of knowing what actual level support he received were. In mid 2020, Lily heard about Daniel Manalo's abuse of participants in Mount Druid Day program from other families she knew. She was shocked, particularly because Simon had received one-to-one -one support from Manali. She was disappointed that she heard nothing from a Ford about the abuse, and there was no communication about steps being put in place to prevent something like it from happening again. In September 2020, Lily raised several concerns with a new Ford team leader about the supports and services being provided to Simon. 
While this resulted in some improvements, these were short lived. And when the team leader left, Lily decided to withdraw Simon from the day program. She would describe how Simon now receives one-to-one -one support from a support worker who comes to the house and takes him out for activities. She also say how she's been progressing. He has been progressing, and I quote, in leaps and bounds, unquote, since that time. And I now turn to the third witness for today, Susie. Susie and Rob are the parents of Toby, who is 22 years old and the youngest of their six children. Toby, Susie and Rob live together with their dogs in Western Sydney. Susie describes to Toby as a joker and a smart young man who people often underestimate because he is nonverbal. Toby lives with Down syndrome and experienced severe bowel problems as a young child, meaning he is now peg fed. Peg feeding commissioners relates to a system whereby a flexible feeding tube is placed through the abdominal wall and into the stomach. Like Jason and Simon, Toby attended a local high school for students with disability, which he loved. In 2020, when he's finishing up at school, the family began considering what he would do afterwards. And with Toby, decided that a day program would allow him to make friends and participate in activities with people his own age. Toby began transitioning to the day program offered by Ford in Mount Druitt in October, 2018. After he finished up at school in December, 2018, he began attending the day program five days per week. He was excited to attend the day program and initially looked forward to the afford vehicle turning up in the morning to take him there. Like Sally and Lily, Susie will tell you that many of the staff at the Mount Druitt day program were excellent, including some of the team leaders. However, the turnover of team leaders and lifestyle assistants pose major challenges, particularly with respect to communication between the family and the day program. Also like Sally and Lily, Susie and Rob struggled to understand the invoices sent by Ford for the services that Toby received. Susie would describe the invoices as, quote, inconsistent and confusing, unquote, to the extent that she and Rob had to hope that there would be sufficient funds in Toby's NDIS plan to cover them. She'll also say that in the end, they lost faith that Toby was actually receiving the services and supports from a Ford that his NDIS funding was paying for. Toby was among participants in the Mount Druitt program who were abused by Daniel Namali. Susie will tell you of her and Rob's horror when they found out about the abuse and how they developed a deep mistrust of people we did not know being involved in Toby's care. Susie will say they never received any written acknowledgement of or apology for the abuse of Toby from the Afford organisation. Susie and Rob finally decided to withdraw Toby from the day program in June 2021 after they received the bill from a Ford for activities purportedly done by Toby when he'd been on holiday in New Zealand with his family. Susie will call this the final straw and say that fundamentally we did not trust a Ford to provide safe and quality services to Toby in a way that was transparent to and collaborative with us. Can I now move to the other witness proposed to be called during this inquiry? Tomorrow after hearing the evidence of Sally, Lily and Susie will pick up some of the themes raised in their evidence with two former Ford staff members who worked at the Mount Druitt Day Program. In order to protect their identity, these two witnesses will be referred to as Diane and Erin. Let me deal with Diane. Anne was employed by a Ford for nine years. She will tell you how from a young age, she was passionate about working to support people with disability and how she started out as an Afford lifestyle assistant before the introduction of the NDIS. 
should explain how a forward stay programs operated at a time and will describe some of the changes she observed over time. Diane will describe her promotion to senior lifestyle assistant in 2016 and then swiftly to that of team leader. She'll talk about her transfer from the Ford's Windsor Day program to the Mount Druitt Day program in early 2018 and some of the difficulties she experienced when starting out as a team leader at this latter location. Diane will also tell you how the role of team leader had many components and how the role expanded over time. She'll say there was a constant pressure for the Mount Druitt Day program to increase in numbers and we'll discuss the consequences of that growth on both the staff and the participants at that program. In particular, Diane will address the expectation from afford that team leaders would take on substantial administrative and financial responsibilities. She will say that at times she felt the finance related tasks asked of us as team leaders required accountancy skills. She will describe working significant extra hours unpaid in order to deal with paperwork and really having time to work directly with participants in the day program. Diane will go on to tell you about her efforts to raise concerns about the numbers of clients and other aspects of the operation of the Mount Druid Day Program with her managers and how they responded. Finally, Diane will talk of the impact of the burden of work and how she reached a point in 2019 where she felt she could no longer cope. Her employment with a Ford was then terminated. Diane will share her observations and suggestions concerning how the provision of disability services and day programs could be improved through greater support and assistance to frontline staff. The next witness will be Erin. Erin was employed by a Ford between 2016 and 2020. She began as a lifestyle assistant at the day program in Mount Druitt after about a year was promoted to the position of senior lifestyle assistant. Erin will describe the Mount Druitt Day program operated while she worked there and her responsibilities as a lifestyle assistant and senior lifestyle assistant. She will tell you about the training she was given about how she felt about lifestyle assistants and senior lifestyle assistants who were given insufficient training and guidance in relation to the individual support needs of each participant in the day program. Erin will also tell you about the difficulties she experienced and observed that when it came to accessing accurate, up-to-date information about the support needs of each participant. She will recall how in early 2019, she and the then team leader spent considerable time trying to ensure all the participants' documentation was complete. Erin will also describe the pressures on the staff at the Mount Druitt Day program due to the ever-increasing numbers of participants. Around early 2018, she made a complaint about this to the then district manager. In addition, Erin will tell you about the difficulties she experienced through the system of rostering staff to participants in the day program. She will say that there were occasions when the actual ratios of support provided to participants were not the same as what each client was funded to receive under their NDIS plans. We'll then move to Samantha Taylor. Samantha Taylor is the current registrar of the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission, otherwise known as the NDIS Commission. Commissioners, as you're aware, Ms. Taylor has provided evidence at previous Royal Commission hearings and has, as the former NDS Quality and Safeguards Commissioner, Mr. Graham Head has also provided evidence. That evidence, both written and oral, has extensively covered the role and function of the NDIS Commission with respect to registering and auditing disability service providers, receiving and responding 
to reportable incidents and complaints and taking where appropriate compliance and enforcement action. For this particular hearing, Ms. Taylor has produced under notice a written statement which describes various investigations and actions that have been taken by the NDIS Commission or are in the progress of that happening with respect to a forward. This includes, as I mentioned previously, the civil penalty proceedings in the Federal Court of Australia with respect to the death of Ms. Apram. Among the other matters investigated by the NDIS Commission are systemic issues which came to light during inquiries into Ms. Apram's death and following the publication in June 2021 of a media report about a fraud by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. In addition, Ms. Taylor will describe the actions taken by the NDIS Commission upon receipt of a reportable incident notification from a fraud in May 2020 concerning the abuse perpetrated by Daniel Namali. And finally, Ms. Taylor's evidence will traverse the process of approved quality auditing of service providers under the NDIS, assessing their suitability to obtain and maintain registration as a registered NDIS provider against the NDIS practice standards. She will also give evidence that a fraud was subject to a certification audit by SAI Global Certification Services, PTYLTD, between February and April 2020, and is currently undergoing its first midterm audit conducted by the same approved quality auditor, SAI. Commissioners, I anticipate that on Wednesday morning, we will read out portions of a written statement that's been provided to the Royal Commission by a person who will be referred to as Rachel. Rachel's written evidence was provided under a compulsory notice to give written statement. And she was also required to produce certain documents to the Royal Commission, which are referred to in her statement. Rachel was a former senior executive in a Ford. She worked there until early 2020. During her period of employment, she worked closely with other members of the senior executive team, including the former chief executive officer of a Ford, Mr. Stephen Herald. In order to protect her identity, I will not describe all parts of Rachel's written evidence, nor will her entire statement be read out during the hearing. Among the matters that are set out in the statement, Rachel describes the Afford bonus scheme which you will hear referred to as PACES. Through PACES, the scheme awarded staff for meeting a set of compliance-related targets. Commissioners, PACES stands for Afford Internal Audit and Review Process, Person-Centeredness, Attitude, Customer Service, Efficiency and Standards. I mentioned in passing, it's extraordinary in this sector of our community how often the English language is violated in order to obtain a catchy acronym. Rachel also describes how during the period of her, her employment with a Ford, there was a significant emphasis on growth and its financial sustainability, which was an integral part of the organizational culture at the time. The main thrust of Rachel's evidence relates to her increasing concern in 2018, flowing into 2019 and early 2020, about the safety and quality of the services being provided to afford its clients. As I have alluded to already, these concerns became particularly acute following the death of Myrna Apram in 2019. The internal and external investigations which were conducted in relation to Ms. Upham's death revealed a number of compliance matters that alarmed Rachel. She brought them to the attention of the then CEO and others at a Ford. Eventually in December 2019, Rachel decided she had to raise her concerns with members of the Ford board. She sent them a document that we referred to as a disclosure report along with a number of attachments. Following this, Rachel's professional relationship 
with the then CEO deteriorated swiftly. And by February, 2020, she was on medical leave due to stress. She learned that complaints had been recently made against her by colleagues, which was the subject of an investigation. Rachel ultimately decided to tender her resignation from a forward. Commissioners, there are many matters raised by Rachel's disclosure report to the board, some of which will be the subject of evidence from Mr. Michael Hearn, the current board chair, later in the week. We are alive to the sensitivities involved and note that it is not for the Royal Commission to examine some of the issues relating to complaints and disputes involving Rachel and the former CEO of Afford. However, when a staff member of a disability service provider like Afford raises serious concerns about the safety and quality of services being provided to people with disability, it is open to the Royal Commission to examine the manner in which those concerns were responded to and acted upon. Can I take this opportunity to refer to witness protections applying to this Royal Commission? I'd like to take the opportunity at this point to remind everyone following this hearing of the protections afforded to Royal Commission witnesses. The section six capital D of the Royal Commissions Act 1902 Commonwealth makes an offence for any person to publish information that might enable the identification of a witness who is the subject of the Royal Commission direction. That includes all witnesses granted pseudonyms at this hearing. The second, section six, capital M of the Royal Commissions Act makes it an offence for any person to use, cause or inflict any violence, punishment, damage, loss or disadvantage to a witness who has provided evidence to the Royal Commission for or on account of that evidence. Can I now move to the afford witnesses? Commissioners, in 2020 and earlier this year, the Royal Commission issued a forward with two notices to give information, seeking responses to a series of questions on issues relevant to our inquiries. The written responses provided will be spoken to at this hearing by three witnesses from a forward. Mr. Mike Allen, the chairman of the board. Ms. Joanne Tui, the chief executive officer since October 2021. And Mr. Wayne Adamson, the executive manager of Lifestyle Centres. In addition, Mr. Allen, Ms. Tui and Mr. Adamson provide, have provided brief written statements in preparation for this hearing. We'll hear oral evidence first from Mr. Adamson, who was previously the district manager responsible for the Mount Druid Day program. After Mr. Adamson's evidence, we'll hear from Mr. Allen and Ms. Tui together. Can I indicate, Commissioners, the reason for hearing their evidence together is because Ms. Tui has only recently joined the organisation, it's anticipated that their joint evidence might provide better and more relevant coverage for the relevant period we're looking at. Commissioners, in his statement, Mr. Adamson acknowledges that when he became the Executive Manager of Lifestyle Centres in August 2021, there were clear issues, problems and gaps in the systems, processes and procedures relating to safety compliance and organisational culture. We will be exploring these issues, gaps and problems with Mr. Adamson through the lens of the Mount Druid Day Program and the experiences of Jason, Simon and Toby and their families. We will also discuss several other incidents and events that occurred at the day program and the manner in which they were dealt with by Afford. Before joining Afford, Ms. Tui had an extensive career in the aged care, child, youth and family care and disability services sector. Ms. Tui will describe her observations on commencing the role of a Ford CEO in October 2021. She will discuss the steps she has taken to address the areas she identified as requiring improvement, being policy and procedure, quality, risk, compliance and safeguarding, practice, auditing, complaints processes, and the executive structure. It does suggest that no area will be left untouched, commissioners. 
We'll explore with her the measures that she has implemented and the impact of those measures so far to address these broad areas of improvement. And finally, Mr. Allen has been a member of the Ford's Board of Directors since 2015. He now serves as the chair of the board. Mr. Allen will discuss the governance structures in place in the Ford since he joined the board in 2015 and the role and responsibilities of the board to ensure the safety and quality of services provided by a Ford to its clients. Commissioners will explore with Mr. Allen the development and implementation of a Ford strategic plans, the involvement of the board in pursuing the organization's growth. We'll also discuss a Ford's approach to risk, particularly the assessment and management of the risk of violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation of its clients. We'll also explore with Mr. Allen the matters that were being reported to a Ford's board by its CEO and other executive managers, as well as the actions taken in response to written and oral reports provided to the board for its monthly meetings. Among these matters was a proposal for a support governance framework put forward by a member of the board following the death of Ms. Upram, and the concerns expressed by Rachel in her protective disclosure about the safety and quality of the Ford services and in relation to issues of compliance. Can I summarise? Commissioners will be examining incidents and issues connected with the provision of services by Ford in the recent past. We'll also be discussing what Ford has learned from these incidents and issues. And most importantly, the changes that have been introduced recently or are in programs to try and improve the quality of services. You will hear some witnesses and receive some documents which refer to previous culture of, quote, box ticking, unquote, when it came to issues of compliance within a Ford. You will also hear about the impact of a disability service provider pursuing a corporate approach and prioritising growth and financial performance over other matters. Commissioners, we will not suggest that disability service providers should not take steps to maintain their financial sustainability, nor will we suggest that the service providers should never expand. However, we will examine how the risk of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability might increase when growth and financial matters are given top priority. I'd like to emphasize that this hearing is not about one person within a Ford, nor is it about specific complaints and allegations made concerning former members of its senior executive team. Our focus is on a Ford as an organization and whether as an organization, there may have been failures to prevent or respond appropriately to violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability to whom it provided services. We intend to build upon the previous work of the Royal Commission, particularly the Commission's report on public hearing 13, which was delivered last month. I note in particular the observations made in that report about the importance of disability service providers listening to and working with people with disability to whom they provide services and listening to and working with their families and supporters. This issue will be highlighted again during the course of the week. On a more mundane level, can I speak briefly about procedural fairness and the tendering of documents? Commissioners, you are committed to ensuring that this hearing is conducted fairly and that a Ford and every other former member of its staff who is referred to by name in this hearing should have the opportunity to be heard and respond to the issues we examine. Chair, you will make directions at the conclusion of the hearing as to how you wish council assistance to prepare any written or oral submissions on the evidence and how parties would leave to appear and others may respond to any findings proposed in the council assisting submissions. In addition, as has been the case in previous service provider hearings, the Royal Commission has received extensive documentary records in the course of preparing for this hearing. Some of these records will be discussed during the hearing. 
However, formal tendering of documents into evidence will be done following the conclusion of the oral presentation of the evidence this week. This will allow for any redactions that need to be made in order to protect the identity of any person re requiring that protection and to address any other concern raised by any relevant party. All this will occur prior to the public release of the documents. Thank you, Commissioners. It may be inappropriate to adjourn briefly. Yes, thank you, Mr. Rippon. Um, in order to avoid mass confusion in the hearing room, I should say something about what happens on an adjournment. In this Royal Commission, the practice we have adopted at public hearings is that when we adjourn, the Commissioners are able to do so, stand and give a little bow. That usually induces the uh, legal representatives who are present who can stand do so, and they bow. And that is because they're very good at bowing. They spend much of their professional lives doing it. As far as the people in the audience are concerned, you are entirely free to stand or not as you wish, and to bow or not as you wish, as deeply as you wish, or as shallow as you wish. We shall now adjourn. The Royal Commission is adjourned. Yes, Mr. Pogarty, I think uh, we might uh, resume proceedings. Yes, thank you, Chair. Chair, the first witness today is Sally, a pseudonym. Her son is Jason, as you've heard from uh, Mr. Griffin SC, also a pseudonym. The Royal Commission will hear evidence that Jason attended a Ford's Mount Druitt day program from 2017 to 2021. Sally has signed a statement dated 26 April 2022, and that can be found in hearing bundle A behind tab one. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, just before we continue, I understand there's an appearance for Sally, is that right? Yes, Commissioner. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Sally, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to uh, give evidence today. We very much appreciate your attendance. Uh, if you would be good enough to follow the, uh, the instructions of my associate, he will administer the affirmation to you. If you just follow what he asks you to do. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you, Sally, very much. Now, Mr. Fogarty will ask you some questions. Just in case you're not aware, you may have been here, but on uh, my right is Commissioner McEwen, and on my left is Commissioner Bennett. And we are the three commissioners sitting on this hearing. Yep. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Fogarty. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Sally, I'll start by asking you some questions about uh, Jason so that the Royal Commission gets to understand him better. Also, if there's any time you need a break, uh, we'll be asking you some questions that, that may require um, you to take a pause. Please yes. just let me know. I will. All right. Jason's now 24 years old. Yes, he is. Um, he's a First Nations man. Yes, he is. Uh, and he lives at home with uh, yourself and dad. Yes. Um, he's also very close with his sister, uh, Nicola, a pseudonym. Yes, very close. Um, and I, I note for the benefit of the Royal Commission that Nicola's here today supporting uh, you and her brother. Jason, too, in your statement, was um, very close to his grandmother. He was. And she provided a lot of support for both him and yourself and the family yes, for many, yes. many years, and she sadly passed in yes. uh, 2020. He would sometimes um, stay with her. Um, and she would sometimes um, assist if he needed to be picked up or dropped dropped yes. off from the afford day care program. Yes. Um, can I ask you to describe to the Royal Commission um, Jason? Who is who is Jason? Words to describe him. Um, he's generally a happy young man. He loves his water. He loves being outside. He likes music. He loves his family. Um, he loves his iPad. He uses a program, Prolo Quo to Go, to communicate as well as um, other 
communication such as a sniff for yes. Um, he'll push your hand away if he doesn't want something. Um, he's basically the, the light of our lives. Our, our world revolves around him. Um, and he's now coming back to what he used to be. It has taken a, while, a, long, a long while. He still has many twitches, um, doesn't like people being loud in front of him. He'll cover your mouth. Oh. Uh, generally, that's, that's him. Um, you've provided the Royal Commission and for the benefit of the commissioners, some photos. Yes. One shows Jason out with his one-on-one uh, -on -one support worker by the river. Yes. I think that's from last year. Yep. And uh, another with his sister reading, yes. and both reading together. And the last one, and these are in hearing bundle A, tabs two to four. Um, Jason at flip out, yes. trampolining, and um, yes. also with his one-to-one -one support yes. worker. All right. Um, Jason lives with autism and intellectual disability. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and what support these days does he does he need in a broad sense? Uh, personal care. Yes. Um, so showering, uh, toileting, dressing, um, brushing of his teeth, washing of his hair, washing himself. Um, and then he needs just general help in everyday life. Uh, to cross, we wouldn't allow him outside by himself. To, you know, <coughs> he needs to have someone to cross a road. He needs someone to be with him twenty four seven. I see. Yes. The personal care you refer to is that provided by his one to one support yes. worker, and that's covered under his ESTA NDIS yes. funding. Yes. All right. Um, is that seven days a week, or is it Monday to Friday? That's no, Monday to Friday. All right. Um, Jason attended the Afford Mount Druitt Day program full-time from 2017 is that right yes and he transitioned the year before when he was in year 12 yes all right and he remained there until mid 2021 yes. all right and since then as you've just referred to he has one-to-one -one support yes. with one with one support yes, person yeah. we'll come back to discuss that a little bit more later when he was attending the afford day program was it from 2017 was it was it five days per week yes Monday to Friday yes uh, and I think at that time Nicola was living at home with she was with yourself and um and dad and all of you were working full-time yes all right um you've worked as a student learning support officer in SLSO yes do you still do you still perform that do that yes work? I do and I also have a contract with the Department of Education for uh, assist school travel for children with disabilities. And your SLSO is uh, in between. Work, work is with the department yes. as well? Yes, it is. All right. Um, were you a, uh, sorry, withdraw that. Were you uh, ever an SLSO at Jason's school? No. 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 All right. In terms of Jason's schooling, I think he, he went from, uh, in your statement, you refer to ages four to 19. Yes. Um, how would you describe his high schooling um, and the he, outcomes? He enjoyed it. The outcomes were, were great. His teachers um, worked with him in, on every level. They, they helped with his prolo quote to go. They used the um, board maker with flashcards. Yes. They taught him how to swim, um, how to shop. Um, he would go occasionally bowling. So, and yeah, he, he seemed to make strides at school. In um, 2016, the NDIS came in for yes. Jason. Yes. Um, and uh, I think you or he received support and you and the family assistance from Gilgai Aboriginal yes. Centre. Yes. Um, and was that um, support coordination in terms of the NDIS plan? No, or? just plan management. I see. Yeah, they, they were actually on board with us before the NDIS came in. Yes. So we chose to stay with them because they gave us so much support. Did they provide advocacy support as well for Jason? They did, but they weren't paid for that. I see. That was, that was just something they did to, to help. All right. Um, and I think we'll come to this in your statement and your evidence that 
they became intimately involved in reviewing the invoicing and billing yes. that Afford yes. um, was engaged in with you and, and Jason. Yes. Uh, do Gilgai still support Jason? No. There was a handover at one stage, yes, I think, in was. terms of support coordination. Um, you mentioned uh, in your statement that you bought uh, Jason uh, an iPad and installed the app. Can you just explain to us how the app works and the relationship with the communication? The app, it's called ProLoco to go. And what it does is we can put in our own photos or use their photos. And James can also type on it to, and it will speak for him. So say he want, needs a shower, he'll, he'll get his iPad and he'll just press the, the little flash card that says shower and then he, it'll say it for him. Thank you. And that was first used in, was that used in high school for yes. Jason? Yes. All right. The decision was made for Jason to attend a day program. How, how did you, how did the family and, and Jason reach that decision? Well, we knew that we couldn't um, give up work and we, we all worked long hours. Yes. So um, this, when, when it come to that time, the school would ref, refer services that they either knew of or I, I don't know how the school come about that, but we were sort of lent towards a Ford yes. because of the hours that they could do. All right. And the services they provided. And was was their day program how far away from home was it at the time? Maybe one k. All right. So, and yeah. that was that a track? Was that yes. An, a, yes. an appeal as well? Yes. What did you hope Jason uh, would get out of the day program? I don't, I hope that he would learn to socialise more, to do activities that he enjoyed. Yes. Um, learn just simple things like maybe to use an air fryer or to cook or it, it, mainly the socialising yeah. because I think it's important. Yes. You know, they he sees his sister go and socialise and at some stages there I could watch him and he would see her go out and come back and I used to think to myself, is he thinking, well, why can't I do that? Yes. So that they were... Um, yeah. That was a big part of yes. the day yeah. program for him and also I think you say using the air fryer, so building, yeah, just building life skills. skills. Yes, yeah. Um, he attended the Cherrywood site as well. Yes. What was did. at the Cherrywood site? Um, they had, it seemed to be a more open space. So swimming pool, I think there was animals there. Yeah. And I think that um, he could use like the hose to water the garden. I see. And, and like that, that was in a Ford site as well. Yes. All right. Yes. Did, you, did you yourself attend it? Uh, the Cherrywood site? I never went to Cherrywood, no. And um, what about... His Mount... dad did. I see, sorry. Yeah. And what about the Mount Druitt site before he started there? Did you, did you... Before he started there, yes, we went there. I think it was three or four times. Okay. Yeah. And what impression did you... Did you... Um, it looked nice. Um, it looked inviting. They had a nice backyard. Um, every time we go there, the clients were like playing music and, and seemed to be enjoying themselves. Uh, and this is the Paul Street address? Yes. All right. Yes. Because later on the centre moved, yeah. correct? Yes. Jason also received personal care in the mornings yes. from a Ford? Yes, he did, yes. Um, and then he would be picked up and transported by an Ford uh, yes. minibus? Yes. Um, to the day program and also brought back in the afternoon, yes. is that right? Was there a, a set schedule in terms of personal care uh, and then pick up? each day um, and perhaps let's say from 2017 when he started yep. was there a set schedule that may have changed over time um is there a time that the personal care would start and end? yes yes because of my like my contract with the department of education it depended on the run that i had so they could start at quarter past six in the morning right anywhere up until seven quarter to seven all right yes so what time would personal care a support it, person come sometimes Quarter past six. I see. All right. And what about the, the transport, the, the bus? Well, I was never there. I, I'm i pretty sure they used to come between 8 and 8.30. All right. That's what I, I was told. And, and Nicola, when she was still living at home, would, would, would often be the person who did the handover in sense? No, no, she would be gone as well. I see. So, yeah, it would be the per, 
person doing the personal care. Oh, so they would stay yes. with Jason yes. until, the, until yeah. the transport came, yeah. I see. But would that, would the personal care support person, that they wouldn't transport? Some days when, um, later on, sometimes I think they did, yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Because they would turn up in an Afford uh, vehicle. Right, yeah. I see. Uh, Afford had service agreements uh, for Jason and, and with, with the yeah. family, is that yes. correct? Yes, yes. Um, and those agreements had quotes for their services, yes. rates and, and costs, yes. so, to, so to speak. Yeah. Um, what else do you recall was in those agreements? Do you recall other parts of those agreements? Uh, Mr Fogarty, which time are we talking of and uh, which agreements are we talking of? I think there may Just have been you, different Chair. agreements um, at if, different times, possibly. Yes, Chair. Um, if the witness might be shown, or if we could um, have on screen for the witness, it's a 2018 service agreement behind hearing bundle A, tab 13. Sally, you see that document yes. there, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's you see at the bottom there's a reference to 2018. Yep. And then if I if I take the doc, if I go two pages over to page three of twelve, the very top 3.1 reads: the agreement will commence on 17 May 2019, the period of 52 weeks, yep. and will end on 16 May 2020. So this is a 2019 service agreement. Yep. Uh, do you recall, uh, I, I won't take you to the part, but do you recall whether there is information in that service agreement about feedback by families or clients? No, um, there may be, but no, I don't. All right. Um, do you recall this? agreement in particular? Yes, this is the quite outlandish one. All right, might I take, uh, if I could ask to go to the last page of this yep. document. I apologize, I'll probably jump around different pages here. Yeah. Uh, and you see some handwritten. Yes. It says changing amount to original S slash A amount to $117,524.24 until new plan manage meeting just to have correct info on site to cover Jason's support until new plan. Yes. Your signature is also on that yes, last page. Yes. Um, do you know who wrote that handwriting at the bottom? It was the team leader at the time. All right. And why was Sorry, that? can I? Can I just, I'm trying to follow the chronology. Um, when um, did Jason start at the daycare centre? 2017. Right. This document we're looking at says the agreement will commence on the 17th of May 2019. Was this the first service agreement no. that you entered into? No. So there was one, was there? in yes. about 2017. Yes. Okay. This agreement on the last page and it seems to say that it was signed on the 3rd of December, 2020. I don't know whether Mr. Fogel is going to ask you about that, but that post dates by a yes. long way, the commencement of the agreement. Mm. Do you have any recollection of the timing? I know it was in the January school holidays. Mm. I know that for sure because the document was handed delivered hand delivered to my home on New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve being the evening before yes. 2020. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this is an agreement, as far as you understand it, that actually commenced well before yes. the data was signed. Yes. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Are you able to explain why? There was, in my words, a gap in timing? No, not at all. Um, team leader maybe looked at, I, I can't say, I, I can't say what the team leader's thoughts were. All right. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you recall the earlier service agreements 
Do you, rec do you recall those agreements? I do, yes, I recall. Were they them. similar to this agreement? They looked exactly the same. All right, okay. Yeah. Uh, do you recall whether um, at the time you received this agreement, you were the Ford officer offered to explain the terms to you? No. What about the ones before then? No. Um, so this one you say was brought to your home by a, a team leader? Uh, the senior. Senior lifestyle yes. assistant. Yes. All right. And what about earlier agreements? How would you receive those? Do you recall? They would be put in a bag, Jason's. Jason's bag, all right, I see. Or emailed. All right. Yeah, but there were maybe one email. One email to you, yeah. all right. Um, was, your, was your contact with the, day, with the day program usually the team leader? Yes. Was it ever, any, was it ever any, anyone else that would contact you? Um, in recollection? Maybe a few times the senior. Lifestyle assistant. Yes. Yes. And was your understanding that, a, that the team leader was uh, above, in yes. a sense, or had, yes. had the senior lifestyle assistant report to them? Yes. All right. If I might take uh, you to page, back to page three of 12, just to look at some of the terms of this agreement. Um, Midway down, it refers to cost and payment terms, and I'll, I'll read this to you. 5.1, the cost of the services which Afford agreed to provide to the participant under the agreement is set out in the quote annexed to the agreement, the costs. Did you understand that the quote, Sally, in this document would set out all of the costs and fees for Jason? Yes, that's what I assumed, yes. All right. Um, underneath that 5.2, Again, I'll read it to you. The parties agree that Afford will quote costs using the temporary transformation payment brackets TTP close brackets support items uh, brackets and price limits close brackets because Afford is or will be before December 2019 become compliant with the TTP terms. Did you know what the TTP was? No. Do you know what it is now? No. All right. And. Did anyone at Afford explain to you what that was? No. All right. No. If we could turn to the next page, page four of 12. There's a clause there, 5.9. If the cost of the services or the amount of funding available for any of the services appearing in the quote is increased during the term, the parties agree that Afford will be entitled to amend the quote to ref reflect the increase in the cost and to immediately charge increased costs for the services in full. Uh, that wasn't a term that was explained to you? No. And then the next clause, 5.10, the participant agrees to be personally liable to Afford for the cost of the services if the participant has overspent their NDIA funds. Was that a, that wasn't a term brought to your attention? No, no. Do you do you understand when I read that to you what that means? Y yes. All right. And do you have any? What, what's your reaction to that clause? Um, what amazed actually because I couldn't afford that. Was there ever a time where you were concerned or the family was concerned that NDIS funding would be exhausted? Yes. All right. Uh, if Sally, so the service agreement has the quote, if you go to yes. page nine of 12, and then there are three pages, and at the end there's a figure of 173,878. Yes. Uh, do you have an understanding of what that figure refers to? This, the personal care and the, the day program, as far as I knew. Um, and that's when I just, they told me basically if I didn't sign it, it would be suspended until I signed it. And then I tried to ring the team leader over and over, never got contacted. So I just turned up and said to them, that's outlandish. He, he's, his plan's not even that big. And that's when she said to me, don't worry, I'll, 
I'll come to a meeting with you and we'll get it adjusted. And I said, no, no, that won't happen. The quotation, as you can see from page nine, <coughs> refers to a period from the 17th of May, 2019 mm -hmm. to the 16th of May, 2020. Do you see that just under the heading quotation? Yep. <coughs> If the document, and, and it's always possible, of course, that something that's signed in December of any given year has the people anticipating the next year might put the wrong date in, but it's a little strange that we've got the 3rd of December 2020. Mm -hmm. But let's assume that it was signed round about January 2020. Um, was, is there any explanation that you can think of as to why you were given a quotation that relates to a period of um, seven months or so prior to the date the quotation was given to you? No, no. Well, no doubt this is something Mr. Fogarty may wish to explore in due course. Was your concern, Sally, in terms of that $173,000 amount that I think you said it, at the time it exceeded yes. his NDIS yes. plan? All right. And is it the case that the $117,000 figure that's referred to on the last page, was that uh, an agreement by the afford officer to reduce yes. effectively that total amount yep. that the chair just referred you to? Yes. All right. And what that amount of $117,000, was that within the relevant NDIS plan funding? Yes. Uh, right. It was, I think, a couple of dollars over. All right. A few, yeah. Um, and is that... Was that agreement by a forward to reduce that amount um, based on things that you and Gilgai at the time were saying to them? Yes, yes. And I was quite distressed because I was due to go back to work and thinking, what do I do if I don't have a service? Yes, and I think James. you said they, there was evidence that they'd said to you or you were concerned that he would be suspended if yes. the agreement wasn't signed. Yeah. I think yes, thanks, Bennett Commissioner Bennett. Um, when they adjusted it from 117 to 117,000 to fit the plan from the 173, did you get a sense that they were going to do less or did they just change the price? She just changed the price. She just said, okay, then we'll just put it down to that to the 117. So there was no sense of less of this or reduction of something else or... No, nope. not at all. Thank you. Uh, just for clarity, the person you were, was the person you were negotiating with, was that still a senior life assistant no, or was it a team leader? leader. Or, yeah. If I could take you to page uh, five of 12, there's a clause there headed rights and responsibilities of the parties. Just 7.2, just towards the bottom, says afford agree to, and then if you turn the page, there's a couple of Roman numerals I'd like to ask you about. Roman numeral four on page six of 12 says that Ford agreed to provide information to the participant with respect to the cost of additional services not included in the quote, but which are necessary to meet the participant's goals, e.g. the cost of entrance fees, rent tickets and meals. There were some of those expenses and fees yes. that were asked of you and, and you the family paid yes, for those. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. The next um, Roman numeral five says, afford, agree to communicate openly and honestly with participant and seek to respond to feedback and complaints in a timely manner in accordance with the terms of the agreement. Was that your experience? No. no. Um, the next uh, sub... Uh, Roman numeral six, afford agree to consult the participant about decisions on how services are provided. Was that your experience with no, Afford? No, no. Uh, and lastly, um, in this clause, Roman numeral nine, afford agree to keep accurate records of the support provided to the participant. Um, did you on occasion request records about Jason from yes, Afford? Yes, I did, yes. Um, and did you? Did you receive those records? No. I see.
Um, the chair, if we could move please to page 10 of 12, back to the landscape quote or quotation page. Thank you. The, the chair referred to the period as 17 May 2019 to 16 May 2020. Mm -hmm. In the uh, first row, refers to, and first column, it refers to core supports, assistance with daily life. Yep. So is that personal care? Is that what you understood? Yes. yes. And then underneath that, core supports, assistance with social and community participation, and you understood that to be the day program. The day program. Yes. And then the fourth uh, column across frequency requested. So uh, two and a half hours per day. This is for core supports in respect of personal care, five days per week uh, equals 12 and a half hours per week, 52 weeks. Did Jason in this year attend, did he attend 52 weeks per year? No. And in any of the, the no. years he was there? No. All right. Um, and underneath that, similarly, you see in the fourth column with the day program, six hours per day times five days per week equals 30 hours per week and times 52 weeks. And then there's a figure of the total hours. Mm -hmm. um, so the assumption there is that for 52 weeks of the year, he attends five days per week for six hours the day program. Yep. But your your recollection is he didn't no, attend 52 no. weeks no. a year. No. Was it was the day service available 52 weeks of the year um, when he was there? They closed for Christmas. They closed down a week every year for staff to do. I don't know what the staff did. I see. Yeah. Was the Christmas break a week or? Two, um, I believe. Two, Four. it could have been three. I'm not. Four. Um, if we could turn to the next page, please, which is page 10 of 12. The bottom, I think that's 11 or 12. One of those, right? Thank you. The bottom row, uh, Far left column says not NDIS funded supports. Then, if you work your way across, support item reference number NA. Um, yep. Then, afford service support requested daily contribution fee to attend day program. Next column, payable upon uh, attendance. Price quote, <coughs> dollar sign amount varies per activity, and then total dollar sign per day. Brackets includes contribution to activity costs, but also includes costs for overheads. Did the team leader explain this part of the quotation to you? No. no. But did Jason pay a daily contribution fee, to your knowledge? No. All right. We move to the next page, page 11, which is, I think, the last part of the quotation. The entry here is non-NDIS chargeable item. Support item reference number varies service slash support requested varies then frequency requested 78 cents per kilometer after 15 kilometers traveled price slash quote to be invoiced to the participant monthly is that a do you understand that to be a fee for transport when we first started we paid for transport yep out of his pension and then it was put into the ndis funding all right. I don't don't know when that changed over. All right. So when you say it is uh, sampling payments, did that come out directly or was it? No, I paid it. All right. Yeah. I see. Um, Jason attended Club of Ford. Yes, he didn't did. He? Um, what what in short was Club of Ford? They would go out on a Saturday to different activities. Yeah. Yeah. So. So it was still part of the Ford. Yes. Um, uh, was it? Were there separate fees for Club of Four? Um, it went under his NDIS. It was a, a, se a separate charge for Four. the day. Um, and then he, I just gave him spending money or and for what he, the activity or whatever or he needed. fees, yes. or depending on what, what they're up to. Um, and how long did 
that's in the pen of a forward. I can't, I can't remember exactly how long. The whole time he no, was no. Why did he stop attending public four? Because our funding was running out. All right. So yeah. you were you were you were concerned yes. that it would yeah. run out and you wouldn't be able to go to the day through program. the week when yeah, exactly. the family was working. Yes. Yeah. All right. And what was your impression of Jason when he got to Club Four? Did he did he enjoy it? He... Um he seemed to come home happy most times. Yeah. Yeah. Except for one time, well. I didn't, Ford didn't tell me about this incident. Um, I was at a friend's birthday party and a person walked up to me and said, you're Jason's mum? And I said, yes. And she said, do you know that the Ford worker fell to sleep in the car with Jason on the weekend, on Saturday? I saw. And I approached the team leader after that to find out what happened. And what, what, what did the team leader Oh, yes, do yes, that? that happened. We've moved that worker on now. All right. And that's, I didn't get an incident report. I didn't, that was it. That was it. <clears throat> um, in your statement, you set out, I'd just like to touch upon it and come to it in more detail, a list of concerns that started to, in my words, grow for you. Firstly, concerns around inconsistent morning personal care. Yes. Um, and also the transport pickup times. Yep. Uh, second, concern around staff ratios of support yes because jason started as one to three he did he did but he later became one, one to, to one. one yeah and that was reflected in his ndis funding yes <clears throat> can we work out which the timing is that possible when did it change you know i tried to um work it out and i can't exactly remember okay. i know it was maybe Maybe a year into, or not even before the year he was there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think we might come to it. Yeah. yeah so yeah. in August 2018. Um, concern around a lack of choice of activities yes. is another concern. Four uh, additional activities fees that you pay. Yep. And an account for those fees. Uh, that is, you weren't receiving receipts or itemised no. accounts for the money you were providing for him. No. The other concern I think you talk about is the lack of communication or very little communication from a forward to you about Jason. Yes. Uh, yep. What was what he was doing at the centre? Yep. Uh, who was supporting him? Mm -hmm. You also had concerns, isn't it, so around behaviour support? Yes. Uh, and whether his behaviour support plan, he had a behaviour support yes, plan. Yes, he did. Whether that was being implemented? Yes. All right. We've also touched upon this. I think another concern you had was quoting and invoicing yes. against yep. Jason's NDIS funding. Yep. And last and most significantly, perhaps, is uh, that Jason was abused by yes. Daniel and Emily. Yep. Turning to the uh, personal care uh, concerns, and I think you've touched upon those. Um, was it the case that on, on occasion the personal care person wouldn't wouldn't attend or would fail? Yes, to, yeah, know. I'd be needing to go to work and I would call the team leader. Sometimes it could have been 10, 15, up to 20 times in the morning and they just wouldn't answer their phone. Um, and what effect would, would that have on Jason? Well, he'd be distressed All right. because he's, he's very routine. Yes. And when the routine wasn't going as per normal, he, he'd get distressed. All right. Um, do you recall whether, moving on to, to the choice of activities, whether Jason was ever offered choice in terms of activities? Not that I can recall. Right. I do recall getting a list for Club Afford on what they were doing on the weekends, yeah. but not day program. And sorry, I should just clarify, Club Afford was only on a Saturday. Of a Saturday, yes. Right. About how many hours? Uh, I, think, I think we dropped them off at nine and picked them back up Three or four o'clock. And this was at the Mitchenbury office? Started started at McDonald's at Mitchenbury okay. when he first started and then moved over to the office. Sure. Um, you provided some additional activities fees and, sorry, you met those. Was, was that by handing money to Jason to take with him or how did you? 
Paint yeah, I just put it in the front of his of his backpack. All right. And did you receive receipts for that? No. Cool. Um, and how much roughly might that be? $20. I see. Yeah. And that would be for Club Afford or for the day program as well? Um, both. Like if he needed money for Club Afford, I'd put it in there if he needed it. Now, did, did, I just will sorry. say, sorry, I'll say with um, a couple of the lifestyle workers um he i did get receipts for meals yeah but it wasn't consistent i see and did jason have a choice in who supported him at the day program um there there was a choice in such that there was um it started off where he could have many different workers and then it sort of slimmed down to the workers that they would let have Right. Yeah. Um, and how would, would you go down to the centre yourself to? I'd have to go to the centre. All right. I would have to. I would have to go to the centre. I was told by the um, CEO that I was known to be the parent that just turned up. All right. And why would you turn up? What reasons? Concerns. All right. And had you that... tried to contact? Yes. Yeah. The team leader. Yep, many times. By telephone. Yep. Um, were there any regular meetings? No. With no, family. There was meetings only when I'd asked for meetings, or my plan manager would say, "I think that we need to meet with them and try and sort this out." So meetings were prompted. Yep. Entirely. Yep. By yourself or the plan manager. Yep. Were you ever invited by Ford to give client feedback or no. consumer feedback? No. Um, can I just clarify, there were some occasions, weren't there, where Jason exhibited behaviours of concern? Yes. And were there times where you were called to come and pick Jason up? Yes. Did you, what, what happened on, well, through all that, did you ask for, ever ask for incident reports about those? Yes, I did. All right. And there was, I think in your statement, you referred to an occasion where Jason had butted a wall at the Cherrywood yes. site. Yep. And an ambulance was called. Yes. Um, did you ask for an incident report yes. for that? And was yes. one provided? No. Who did you ask? The team leader. Always the team leader. By telephone, in person? Yes, by telephone. By telephone. Yep. Um, Jason was there for I think, approximately four to five years. Yes. Um, did, team, did the team leader change? Many times. All right. Were you... Were you told, were you informed by no. Ford about how no. did you find that out? Um, you'd make a phone call when you were told oh, that this is the new team leader or you'd turn up there and there was a different team leader. Okay. Um, a communications book was used at one stage, yes. wasn't it, with, yep. with Jason and the Ford. What, what is a communications book? Um, it was a A4 size. And it had like a diary and it also had flashcards. So there were sections for them to stick on on what yeah. had done that day yeah. or for ask for things with his flashcards. Had he had, had had he used one of those or had one of those been used? The whole was time it? he was at school. He yeah. was at school. All right. Um, comparing the experiences, what how did what was your experience with a communications book with a Ford? Uh, it only lasted while that one team leader was there. In and the four to five years that he was yes, there? Yes. Yeah. How long roughly would that have oh, been? Oh, very short. Um, that, was, that was after the, there was an incident where the one where they suspended. All right. And that's, that's where um, he was, it was informed of you that uh, a worker had gone on workers' compensation. Yes. Yeah. And you're also told, weren't you, that two other workers had yes. gone on workers' compensation. Yes. And that was the first time you'd ever heard first time. that there'd been those yeah. behaviours. Did you ask for instant reports in respect I of did. those? Yes, I did. Did you receive any? No. Again, you asked the team leader. Yes, I did. Yep. Actually, with that one, I actually sent an email to, to the CEO at the time as well. Um. The behaviour support plan 
that Jason had, was there one that was provided when he transitioned across from school? Yes. Um, did Afford uh, offer to update that or review that? No. Um, did you seek to have an updated one? Yes. And how did you how did you arrange that? Through his psychologist. So it was done independently of yes. Afford? Yes. Um, and the psychologist went and observed him at the day program? Yes, she did. Do you recall what her observations were? any of her observations when she did that? Um, she told me that they weren't trained in the use of technology such as this iPad. They didn't use the flashcards. They didn't use Boardmaker or any of the flashcard uh, programs. Yes. And that they had no boards up at the centres where he could go and grab a flashcard and give it to a staff member. She said there was no communication aids for him at all. And were those things something you'd observed he he had at his at his high school? Oh, definitely, yes. Um, is it fair to say that, put bluntly, you didn't know what was happening day to day yes. when Jason when Jason was there? Um, in your statement, I think you say, and I'll just read it. The reality is that we just do not know exactly what Jason did each day yes. there how he was developing or what benefits he was getting from the program. There was yeah. virtually no communication. There was no transparency. No, that's right. And was that, was that a, a summary of the whole time he was there or did it get worse over time? It, it depended on the team leader. I've got to say there was one team leader that put in a lot of effort and she was the one that made the booklet up and everything. So that was the only time that there was ever any communication aids. I could ask for a document to be shown. It's a, the next next document, which is an email. It's behind hearing bundle A, tab eight. This, I think, Sally, is uh, a complaint to yes. be sent to Mr. Herald, the yes. CEO, on 8 August 2018. Yep. Um, are you familiar with its contents? Yes. All right. So here it's... Um, it's, it's where the workers' compensation issue was raised yes. and he was suspended. How long was Jason suspended for, do you remember? I think it was three days. And you had to go and have a meeting? Yes, I had the, the meeting centre. on the Friday, yes. Right. In your um, email, sorry, I'll draw that. Um, what prompted you to write to the CEO on this occasion in August 2018? Because we were just... Getting no answers. When you say no answers, from whom? From the team leader. Right. Yeah, there was, you just, you couldn't get, there was just no contact. They just, she just wouldn't answer the phone. And this is where you were concerned about these incidents. Yes. And you yep. requested incident reports. Yes. Yep. In this email, um, you refer to the suspension and that his grandmother had to look yes. after him. Yep. Because you were all working. You, um, refer to his psychologist coming out to review his behaviour management plan. Some ex excerpts. She explained to me that she noticed a lack of communication yes. aids, which you just referred to. Uh, I've asked for a copy of the incident report from Tuesday and a couple of times in the past I'm yet to see a single copy of the report. Yep. The last time I requested an incident report was when he, he had a meltdown a week before school holidays when his usual workers were not in. Yes. Uh, and they were replaced with people he's unfamiliar with. Yes. Did, did that happen from time to time? Yes. Were you ever provided with um, information about, from a Ford about who, who his workers would be? Not until he was assaulted. And then I, I said- By Mr. Newley. Yes. And I said, you can't send people to my home that we do not know. And what happened then? What did, what did a Ford do when you said that to them? Why that team leader was there for a short period, she would send me the roster on who was coming. All right. What about um, in terms of identifying with, with the photos or back? No. Are there any other information? No. Oh, they don't even have, they didn't even wear badges. Sometimes they had an Ford shirt on, sometimes they didn't. Also in this email of August 2018, you, you explain, don't you, why you're asking the incident reports? Yes. You say you don't condone his behaviour, but I need to know what happened before his meltdown in order to change and improve his behaviour. Exactly. Behaviors. Yes. Did you expect that a Ford and, it, and its workers would understand that concept? Yes, yes. Um, and is that something that 
when he was at school. Most definitely, that's what we do. We the school would call me up. Yep. We'd discuss what happened prior to the meltdown. Yep. And then we accordingly deal with how we can put things in, into the structure so it didn't happen again. And then would there be consistency between home and school as yes, well when, you, when, most when those sorts of things yes. were happening? Or yep. that just didn't happen with the no. um, You also say additionally more communication is key. His communication book can go days and weeks yep. without any communication. Um, then you refer to him um, being non-verbal, mm -hmm. largely, um, and it's difficult to know what is happening yes. on a day-to-day -day basis. Yep. You also, at the end of the email, suggest that the suspension was, in my words, a, a blunt instrument, that mm -hmm. there should have been another way to yes. approach yep. this. Uh, and I think you say you felt it's been handled very unprofessionally. Yes. You say that you feel Jason shouldn't be alienated he needs good quality in his life and to be in an inclusive environment. Yep. Did um, did Mr. Harold, the CEO, respond to that? No. Um, then um, what did you do after that? Did you go down to the centre from recollection? Oh, there was a, a meeting. Yes. And I walked in and there was four workers sitting around the table. This now is I'm... while he was suspended? Yes, yes. All right. And one was the team leader, and I couldn't tell you who the other three were. I know they introduced themselves to me, but at that stage, uh, I don't know. Um, and what what was agreed in terms of his return? That they would, um, they bought him a, a chair for a room at Cherrywood so he could have a nice like, little room with a chair in it. Yep. They would put... Um, like to say a, a box in the car with balls and things for him to play with when they when they took him out. Yeah. Um, and, that, and the and the book and the the new communication book with the human like the, the flashcards. Flash cards. Yep. And so did those changes last? No. As soon as that team leader left, stopped. Um, later in August, uh, yourself, Nicola, and. Jason's plan manager from Gilgai mm -hmm. and another support person from Services Our Way who yep. supported Jason at the time went to a meeting with Ford. Yep. Um, it was a different team leader by that stage. Yes. Yep. Did you request that meeting? Yes. Um, do you recall what issues you raised at that meeting? Uh, the invoices, the communication and the staff um, not being reliable. All right. Um, was... Was Mr. Harold at that meeting? No, no. Um, did you, you had contact at one stage with the district manager, Mr. Adamson? Yes. That was, was he at that meeting? No, that was our soul. All right. Uh, in terms of the invoices, moving to another topic, you concerned about them not being issued regularly? Yes. Uh, that they weren't easy to understand and reconcile yes. between the dates. Yeah, they, yeah, you couldn't understand them at all. And um, Gilgai, um, certainly in 2018 and 2019, were assisting you with a forward and, and understanding yes, that invoicing and that billing. In February 2019, um, Gilgai, on your behalf, write to the CEO, Mr. Herald, yes. again, and if a document can be shown. It's an email dated 26 February 2019. <clears throat> Which tab is it behind? I'm sorry. Uh, it's hearing bundle A, tab 10. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, you're copied into this email, yes. Sally. Yes. Um, do you, in it, and I'll just summarise, I think you've touched upon these. The second substantive paragraph talks about Gilgai making a special effort to meet with three of the Mount Druitt coordinators, um, spending several hours endeavouring to sort out invoicing problems. They, the Gilgai support person says, we find your coordinator slow to invoice, take no responsibility for sorting out accounts receivable discrepancies uh, and only referring to uh, a team leader, only that team leader has ever corrected clearly incorrect invoices. That's correct. Uh, and is that that same team leader you talked about who assisted in putting in place the updated yes. communication? All right. 
Then the next paragraph, uh, we sent the last round of problems through to a different team leader um, in 2018, which the last invoices submitted. So that's four months before the last invoices yes. came through. So that's a, is that one of the delays in? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, and then they refer to a dollar value problem. Gilgai offered to go into BAT for a Ford in respect of a price uh, price rise figure yes. that appeared in, in that document. Um, so when they say go into BAT, is that to approach the NDI, NDIA yes. to see a change in circumstances yes. and, and additional funding? The last paragraph, uh, we've spoken to Sally and think that the only way for Ford to get it together before this plan ends, which is 5 May, is for Ford to appoint a support coordinator for Jason. While this is not the traditional role of a support coordinator, we can see that this may be the only way to negotiate your system in a timely fashion. And then they refer to how much funding is left for Jason. Jason has $7,136 $7, available, although NDIS may already have applied a discount factor. Did the CEO, to your knowledge, respond to that email? Not to my knowledge, no. Um, Gilgai handed over support coordination to uh, another organisation uh, in June 2020. Yep. Um, and you were copied into at least one email yes. where they expressed all of these problems again. Yes. So they were still experiencing similar yes, they were. problems in, yep. in June 2020. Um, I'd like to move to the topic of uh, Mr. Nimalee. Yes. Yep. Um, again, if you need a break, please let the Commission know. Um, it's your understanding that in the second half of 2019, Jason was abused by Mr. Nimalee. Yes. Uh, Mr. Nimalee was a lifestyle assistant who yeah. provided personal care at home. Yes, he did. And also transported Jason. Yes, and was with him during the day for, for the day program. As part of the day yes. program. It's your understanding that Jason was filmed by Mr. Nimalee yes. uh, naked or partially yes. naked in the, in the bathroom in his yes. own home, your yep. home? Um, that he was filmed naked or partially naked in the shower and also in a toilet? Yes. I think it, they were at a, yep. a pool on one occasion. And this is out on the activities of the day yes. program. On another occasion, and um, senior counsel assisting referred to this, I think, earlier. Um, in one of the films, Mr. Nimalee is depicted blowing vape smoke yes. on Jason's face and gently slapping his face. Mm. Um, and your recollection from your statement and your, what you understand, am I right, is what the police spoke to you about? Yes. They had seen these videos on the yes. basis of what the, the charge is. Um, I think you say that you understand he laughed at Jason as well while Jason yes. was flinching yes. on that occasion. Um, and also that Mr Numali had filmed himself, uh, I think in your words, taunting and agitating yes. Toby. By yes. driving to a McDonald's and asking if you want a McDonald's. Yes. And then um, when Toby, I think you say Toby appeared excited, or you were you were told he appeared excited. Jason, yep. Sorry, withdraw that. Jason. Um, Mr. Numerly said he couldn't and drove off. Yes. Yes. Um, Taking you to May 2020, um, that's early May 2020, that's when you became aware of, of this abuse? Yes. Um, was it Ford who informed you of the abuse? No. All right, who, who informed you of the abuse? Surrey Hills Police Officers. All right. Um, and um, did a Ford approach you or speak to you at any time around that time about the, the abuse? Any person from... I have received a phone call on the, the police called me on the Friday afternoon. I received a phone call from the CEO on the Saturday morning. And what do you recall the CEO said in that phone, phone call? Um, he was very stuttery. He said, um, I apologise for what's happened. Um, we have counsellor service if you need it. Um, then repeatedly told me I stayed back late when went through all of the paperwork to make sure we employed him properly. And that really stuck in my mind because I'm thinking at this stage, I've just found out that 
my child's been abused at the hand of one of your workers and it's more important for you to tell me that you've employed him properly. Do you recall what you said to him? Did you express that to him at the time? Or you can't recall? I was in shock. I don't, no, no, I was just like, I, after I got off the phone, I remember saying, I don't understand that phone call at all. Did he contact you again about the minimally abuse? I contacted him, um, not about the abuse that he said to me, sorry, he did say to me in that call, you can contact me anytime. Yes. I was repeatedly calling um, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Adams. Mr. Mr. Adams, Adams. Yes. Uh, trying to arrange uh, um, meetings and my phone calls were not getting received or returned, so I called the CEO. All right, and, and that you were con trying to con get in, in touch yes. to talk about changes. Yes, yes. Is that yes. right? because uh, Jason remained still part of the day yes. program and part of the NDIS yes. funding. Um, you attended the court proceedings? Every single one. All right. Um, did afford um, provide any, offer any assistance or no. support during that? All right. No. Did afford ever um, raise with you any, any, uh, any uh, offer of compensation or no. a formal apology? No. Or an apology directly to Jason in a, no. in a way which Jason would understand? No. Um, it's a case, isn't it, that um, you you went down to the centre? Yes. And this is the new centre by yes. this time, wasn't it? So yes. it's the second half of 2020. Yes. Um, because you couldn't get through to Mr Adamson? Yes, or um, the team leader. Or the team leader. Yeah. And was when, when you went there on that occasion, um, he was present? Yes, he was. Do you recall what your interaction was with him, what was discussed? Um, I got scuttled into a side room and the doors were shut. Um, and we just talked about the new centre and that we needed to have a meeting. I see. Um, and did he agree to have a meeting with you? Yes. All right. Um, and this is also at a time when you, you emailed the CEO around about this time to say you wanted a formal meeting? No. Um, The meeting you had, does this assist you, was May 2020, a couple, only about two weeks after yes. you, were, you were told yeah. about what had happened. Yeah. Uh, you attended with Nicola. Yes. Uh, Mr. Adamson was there and the team leader. Yes, and also um, Alison from Gilroy. Gilroy was there yeah. in support as well. Yeah. Um, and what did you, what changes or suggestions did you have for Ford during that meeting, or did you and Nicola have? Well, we asked if their cameras could be put in the vehicles and we didn't want them focused on the worker or just just so you could see or hear what was happening. What and was we the were, response to that? Yeah, and we were told, no, we can't do that. Um, I asked, could there be spot checks? Actually, Nicola asked, could there be spot checks on one-to-one -one clients? So, so random? Yeah, just random. Just come pop into the house or if you know where, you know, they're going to be at this park, could you pop into a park and... Mm. And no, we, we can't do that. That would cost us money. Um, did you discuss or raise anything else that you can recall in that meeting? Um, just that we, we didn't want strangers coming to the house to do personal care, personal care that we needed. Um, if, if a new person was going to come to our home, yes. that we would want them to be two of them and preferably someone that we knew to be with that new person, to train them, to, just for us to feel comfortable. Yes. And yeah. I think, did you say that that did happen? Yes, it did. In? Yes, it did. Um, I think th three or four times. All right. Yeah. And this is in mid, this is May 2020. Yes. Um, but I, would Sally be shown a uh, policy document. This isn't, this isn't, a document that is attached to your statement, Sally. It's behind <coughs> hearing bundle D, tab 25. I just want to ask some questions about one part of it. It's page one of 13, which would be the last document. And those I'd like to take you to. Um, you see, this is headed policy and procedure of use and neglect in your city of Ford. 
name and, and yep. uh, motif there. 4.0 uh, reads policy and 4.2 is where I'd like to take you. Mm -hmm. It says it's expected that everyone who's associated with Afford and is involved in providing services to Afford clients will share Afford's commitment to maintaining an organisational culture that 4.2.1 reads upholds the values and dignity of Afford clients. Yep. Do you feel, can you comment on that as, as based on the experience that your family and Jason had, do you feel that that was something that was met? No. 4.2.2 says builds trusting relationships with Afford's clients, families, advocates and carers. Is that something that happened for your family and Jason? No. 4.2.3 provides services in an environment that is safe and welcoming, welcoming for everyone. No, no. 4.2.4 empowers clients by helping them to understand their rights. No. And then I'll skip down. This is the last one I want to ask you about is 4.2.6 responds proactively to concerns when they arise. Is that a, your, your experience? Definitely not. Jason, continue. So just, just Sorry. to be clear, this, this document, Mr. Fogarty, has a date of approval of the 12th of March, 2020. Yes, thank you, sir. So that document is in force at the time of the abuse of Jason. Uh, as I understand uh, the response to the abuse, but as I understand, Chair, the, the police charges arise from uh, incidents that occurred in the second half of 2019. not uh, detected or the subject of information until May. Until April, May by the police. April, May. Yes, yes, Chief. We were well, actually told um, that he was assaulted. For right, the well, that's time. the date of this document. There may be a predecessor, of course. Yes. I'm sorry, Sally. We were actually told that he was assaulted from the 19th till he, till the, till he was arrested. Sorry, the 19th of The The... Um, 2019 when the, when he was it started and, yes. and then Up till, until till the day he was arrested i see yeah. and the, the police told you yes, that? yes. Uh, jason continued at the center and receiving personal care until the next year 2021 yeah, yeah. You, fair to say you had reservations and concerns oh definitely i can, I, I was visiting other centers i was i was reaching out um the hard part was the services that we needed a lot of services weren't providing and it was just it, it was distressing the whole time trying to find a new service provider or an individual yeah, yeah. And, and speaking of individuals it's so now that he's supported by one-on-one -on -one by yes. a support worker yes five days per week so yes one, similar yep. one Monday to Friday yep. um fully funded by his NDI yes plan. it is yep what are the what are the pluses of, of oh, this arrangement he's socializing He's he he's cooking at home. Uh, How does he socialise? Um, What's his social activities with one-on-one -on -one support? So they'll gather uh, once or twice a week with other um, people with disabilities. They'll play basketball. They'll go to a park and have um, a barbecue. And are some of these other people peers and persons that were with him that. Yes. Mount Druitt. Yes. Are they all from Mount Druitt? As they far as I'm aware. All right. And that does that happen most weeks? Those yes. Sorts of all right. Yep. Um, conversely, are there any downsides in? Do you see any downsides? No. Um, no. And have you observed? What do you observe with with Jason in this new arrangement? Oh, he's just a happier, just a happier person. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, and what about billing and invoicing? How does that? Work? Perfect. So simple. So simple. Easy, easy to read. I understand what I'm paying for or what NDIS is paying for. And do yeah. you see, do you or your partner, uh, Nicola, see the support person most days of the week? Every day. All right. Yep. So there's a, there's, a, there's a chance to talk about what's going Every on, day. what yep. might happen on the weekend. Yep. We get photographs, there. we get videos. Throughout the day? Yes. In your, and by way of wrap up, Sally, my question, the commissioners may have their own questions for you. Um, is it your, do you, do you consider there remains a place for day programs of the type that Jason used to participate in? 
I say if if they do, if you know, to remain, there needs to be some changes, lots of changes. Like like what sort of things? Um more transparency, more um, contact with the, the carers or the parents of the person that is at the service, yeah. the spot checks for one-on-ones. So these Cam things you raised yes. earlier. With yes, the cameras, cameras, training mm. to, to make sure that people can to know how to use the communication aids, know how to, how, like, even such a thing as them going out to the schools and seeing how schools are doing things. Mm. And, and to further that on, so it follows through. So your your experience in Jason's with his school was in high school. Yes. It was a very positive one. Yes. For us. Uh, commissioners, that concludes my questions for Sally. Yes, thank you very much. Sally, if it's okay, I'll ask my yep. colleagues if they have any questions. First, I'll ask Commissioner McEwen if he has any questions for you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Sally. I have one or two questions about the current arrangements mm -hmm. that you were mm -hmm. just talking about. The support worker is, is very aware of what Jason support needs are in yes. terms of communication yes. using the iPad that yes. you talked about. So that's a very clear. Yep. Okay. And you mentioned that he appeared to be happier. Oh, much happier. Do you believe that could be because of the current yes. arrangements? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Bennett. Um, thank you, Sally, for coming today and sharing what's happened. Um, I would have asked some questions when we were referring earlier to the document on page nine of 12, mm -hmm. it talked about um, social community participation um, and building capacity and independence. Was your perception when you started that, when Jason started there, that social and community would be just based in the day program or would that be um, activities where there were um, a, a greater and broader yes social greater, activity yes, greater and broader yes. um, and that that they would be with people with disability and people without disability yes. did that happen not to my knowledge so the community was really just there yes. all day in the day program. Uh, I do believe that they did go out, mm. but I'm not sure. As, as just the, the clients? Yes. Right. So there was no um, ways to um, broaden, the, broaden Jason's to um, community participation? Yeah, not to my knowledge. Um, thank you. And the last question is, it, is it just one person supporting Jason at the moment? One it is. Also... Um, I have reached out to other services that can, if he's carer now, because um, you know you, you can't be there all the time. You need a break. You need you've got your own commitments. So I have reached out to other services that I've um, went and met and have got to know, so we can bring them in when they're needed. So, so you've got. Um other support yes. if that one yes and is that one individual and those other supports are they broadening that social connection yes. and independence yes and what sort of things is so, um they'll, they'll he goes shopping so mm -hmm. he'll he'll go out and he actually pushes the trolley and is asked what would you like to buy so he'll do his own grocery shopping um they go to the movies, so we're in the community, so he's out in community. Mm -hmm. um, he goes to lots of community activities, such as um, a, uh, back in the last school holidays, he was at an ADOC, an ADOC day with everybody from the community. Everybody from the yes. community, not just people. No, with... no. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sally, on your understanding, <clears throat> the... <clears throat> abuse of Jason that occurred did occur over a period of yes. time in 2019. To 2020. Into 2020. Yeah. Obviously, when someone is charged with criminal offences, it's necessary to specify the particular yeah. offences, but your understanding is that 
behavior or abusive behavior might well have a continued yes. period of time. During this period, what was your understanding of the ratio of care that Jason was meant to be one, getting? One to one. One to one. Who was the main person providing that one to one care on your understanding during this period at the day centre? Um, he had, there was three different workers that worked with him. One of whom was the perpetrator yes. of this abuse. Yes. Have you ever received a formal apology? No. Have you ever received an offer of compensation? No. Or Jason received no. an offer of no. compensation? Have you ever received uh, anything that would amount to a refund of the fees that no. you were paying? No. During this period? No. Just, may I, may I'm I just sorry, go ahead. Say, I just want to tell you how I felt. I felt the day he was arrested, a Ford's gone, wash my hands of him, he's been arrested. That's it. We don't need to deal with anything else. Have you ever said to a Ford yes. that you don't want to have an apology? No, no, sorry, no. no. I said to a Ford that I felt like they washed their hands. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, I understand. Just one other matter. In paragraph 18 of your statement, <clears throat> you say that Jason's school actively encouraged us towards a Ford yes. Day program. Yes. Jason's school, I take it, is what is commonly known as a special school. Yes. How was this active? How did this active encouragement uh, manifest itself? Um, they just told us that they had that they had a lot of students that had previously gone from there to a Ford, and that they found it to be a good service, and that they did. Um, so, like they did more services than say some of the others, some of the other uh, support services. So they they did the home care, they did the pickups and the drop offs. I see. <coughs> and was the school that Jason attended a, a state school or was it yes. a private? School? It was a state school. State school yes. I see. Yeah. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Pogger. There's there's a question that I've got that perhaps you and Mr. Watson can sort out, and it's really to do with the financial arrangement. We can't expect Sally to remember the details of all these financial arrangements, but I'm a little puzzled about some things. We have a document, and there may be other documents in the 15 volumes or so that are behind me, but we have a document that indicates uh, that uh, there was an NDIS plan that was communicated uh, to Jason and I assume Sally on or about the 17th of May, 2019. This is the plan that provides for a $117,134 for an amount that would cover the daycare program. That is the more or less the amount, as Sally has said, that was uh, put into the service agreement in a handwritten notation. If I were to hazard a guess, I would say that the service agreement was actually signed on about the 3rd of January or thereabouts 2020, the number 12 probably a mistake the number for January in the light of what Sally has said. Um, what I'm trying to understand is what happened between May 2019 when there's the NDIS plan for $117,000 and the signing of this agreement in January 2020, what sort of, what are the charges? Who is paying the charges? How are they working out what the amount is? And where do we get the $173,000? So there's, I think, a number of things that need to be worked out, uh, just the relationship between these various events. Perhaps that's something that can be discussed with Mr. Watson. It may be the subject of evidence later on, but it would be helpful to know because there are some rather what aspects of the chronology? Yes, Chair, thank you. Yes. All right. In that case, now um, I'll Chair, I'll, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry yeah. can I interrupt? Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question to what the Chair asked you about the post-school option from the school? Did the school talk about other options, you know, um, to give you lots of options to consider about what Jason could do after leaving school? Um, no, they um, we we knew that he had to be in a day program. So they, they, I think there was about three different but day programs that, that they basically offered, but steered us closer towards a Ford because of the service they provided. 
So really, you're only given option about yeah. day programs. Yeah. They didn't talk more broadly about no. all sorts of things. No, no. No. Okay. No. Thank you. Sally, I'll just inquire whether there's any other uh, representatives who may wish to ask you questions. I'm not guaranteeing they will be allowed to if they do, but I'll just make the inquiry. Is there anybody who wishes to ask uh, Sally any questions? No. All right. Thank, thank you very much. In that case, Sally, thank you again thank you. very much. We very much appreciate you coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence and for all of the assistance you have provided in your written statements. That's I just very like to say to thank you for um, allowing me to give my son a voice. Thank you. That is one of the reasons we're here. Thank you very much thank for you. giving your son a voice. Shall we take an adjournment? Now we'll practice our adjournment procedure. We will now adjourn. It is now a quarter to one. We'll adjourn until one uh, till one forty-five. I think the plan There's a question been, mark may here. have been to have a shorter luncheon. Adjournment. Was that the plan? How short a short minutes, I think it was on our was one thirty. If one thirty. All right. Well, we'll adjourn to one thirty, and now we'll chair. practice our adjournment. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Mr. Fogarty. Yes, thank you, Chair. The next witness is appearing by audio visual link and goes by the pseudonym of Lily. She's the mother of Simon, which is also a pseudonym. I see Lily on the screen. Uh, she has a signed a statement dated 28 April 2022, Chair and Commissioners. This can be found in hearing bundle A, tab 15. I'll just check that. Lily, you have a copy of your statement? Yes, I do. Thank you. All right, just before, just before we um, <clears throat> commence uh, with uh, Lily's evidence, first, may I thank you very much for being prepared to give evidence uh, before the Royal Commission. We do appreciate the assistance that you have provided uh, and uh, the uh, statement you've already given us. Uh, I think you have indicated uh, that uh, you wish to take uh, the affirmation and I'll ask uh, my associate to administer that to if you'd be good enough to listen to what he says and just follow his instructions then we can proceed with the questioning. Thank you very much. I will read you the affirmation at the end. Please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. I'll now ask uh, Mr. Fogarty to ask you some questions. Thank you. If at any time you need to have a break, just uh, let us know, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Lily, can I uh, start by asking some questions about, about Simon? If I'd never met Simon, how would you describe him? Uh, Simon is um, got quite a few disabilities, he's quite a unique character, has a fantastic sense of humour, very dry, um, and likes to torment. He does like to socialise um, in his own way, though. So we often have um, street parties in our cul-de-sac for New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve and stuff like that where he likes to be in charge of the music and, and sing. He's very musically orientated and... That's how we actually taught him his communication through picture cards and music and movies. So he is 20, nearly 27 years old and went to a special ed setting school. And, um, yeah. You provided a, some photographs for the benefit of the commissioners and they're yep. behind hearing bundle A, tabs 23 to 25 the assistance of the Royal Commission. One of them shows Simon at the beach with his wonderful big smile. Mm -hmm. Another shows him drawing, I think. 
And the last one shows him gardening. I think it's fair to say he's pretty avid with his gardening. It's something he likes to do. Yes, he does love to dig in the dirt. <laughs> um, in his early years, um, he had a VP shunt inserted uh, by way uh, from a brain injury. Is that right? When he was very little? Uh, he was actually born with congenital hydrocephalus, which is fluid on the brain, and his fourth ventricle collapsed. So um, he was then shunted at eight months old. Right. And he's been diagnosed and lives with autism and ADHD. Yes, he was diagnosed at 14 months with ADHD. There's a fine line, obviously, between ADHD and autism. I knew he was on the spectrum from a very young age. Uh, he was then diagnosed with epilepsy at the age of three due to his shunt. And due to that many lots of brain surgery, then they um, diagnosed him at eight with autism. I see. And um, he's had seizures in the past, epileptic yep. seizures? He's um, uncontrolled epilepsy, so we can have anywhere between four or five per night. I see. Um, and we can have quite a few during uh, the week. So um, they're not brain damaging at this stage. We've got them fairly as like partial complex seizures, so it's not damaging anymore like they were when he was a lot younger. And there's, oh, there's been epilepsy plans for those that support him? Absolutely. He's had plans right through his schooling uh, from amongst home outing and schooling uh, with speech, with behaviour, uh, with medical side of everything like that. And we tried to, I worked as a SLSO in a special ed school for 12 years before I was medically retired. So, um, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to work and, and trained and got my certificate for uh, to be able to help Simon as well and to be able to advocate for him and to be able to um, give him his need, have his needs and uh, wants met. Lily, what certificate for the benefit of the Royal Commission? What, what, what was I have a cert, a cert 3 in AIN, which is aged care, and I have a Cert 4 in disability. All right. Um, and you and his father are his full-time carers? Absolutely. And you're his NDIS nominee? Yes, I am. Um, <laughs> what support on a daily basis does Simon need? Uh, he's, uh, his daily living skills, so... Um, showering, teeth cleaning, hair brushing, shaving, uh, breakfast made, medications given to him in his hands so he can take them orally, um, bathroom needs, uh, just all his personal care plus his everyday to day life, putting on shoes and socks, um, communication. He does use an AAC device on his iPad. Uh, we use picture cards. He has to have things um, laid out for him so he knows exactly what's going on from, you know, time to time, day to day, routines and stuff like that. Yeah. Or else we do have behaviours and frustration and anxiety. And can that arise from things like a break in the routine or Oh, absolutely. Things being done different, rearranging his room, rearranging, you know, if he knows that at morning tea is at 11 o'clock and it's like 10 past 11, it's like the frustration and the anxiety starts and, and then uh, behaviours can ar arise from that. And presently he's supported one-on-one, -on -one, is that right? Yes, he is. And does that, so does that provider also uh, assist with personal care in the mornings? Yes, she does. And that's Monday to Friday? That's correct. All right. And I'll come back to, to that with you. Um, you. You said you were a student's learning support officer for 12 years. Yes. Um, did you do that at Simon School or schools at any stage? Uh, in 2007, I started at Simon's School and yep. it did become a little bit hard after two and a half years, the 24-7 so I transferred to a sister school in the local area as from 210 uh, to 216 where I was uh, physically injured to the point of medical retirement. All right. Um, Simon attended the Mount Druitt Day program run by Ford from 
uh, some transitioning in term for 2013, his last year of school, up to November 2020. Is that right? That's correct. So cl close to seven years or about seven years? Yes, that's correct. Um, and the decision as to what he would do post-school, how did you, how was it decided he would attend that day program? Uh, we actually went on bus tours uh, through my school and through his school um, and had a look at all different services around the local vicinity through Penrith, Mount Druid and the Blacktown areas. Uh, I specifically chose a Ford because it was actually on my way to work and on my way home from work. Um, and I also knew all the clients that at were at a Ford at that specific time because they were ex-students or ex-school um, friends of my son. So they were passive aggressive. So um, to have Simon in a more passive situation meant that his behaviours wouldn't kick off as much as to if he was in a high aggressive situation, he would become the king of king of aggression so that was one of the main reasons I actually picked a Ford. I see. Did, did he have a behaviour support plan at the end through school and at the end of school? Oh absolutely we uh, worked with addict right through school yes. with a uh, behaviour therapist and he also had a psychiatrist as well. All right and was that behaviour support plan provided to a Ford when he commenced with them? Yes, they actually didn't want to take him on board to begin with Why because um, of his behaviours and because um, he has a P PRN, which is um, midazolam, which is to be given after a five-minute seizures to stop the seizures. And none of the staff or the, or the team leader had actually been qualified to administer midazolam and the team leader at the time told me that she didn't really want to accept Simon into the program because of those reasons and I told her that I actually knew all the clientele that was there and I knew that there were other behaviours and other uh, clients there with epilepsies and PRN as well and I told her that if she didn't accept him I would take her to the discrimination board and they soon accepted him very quickly. I see. Uh, you uh, had service agreements were there service agreements between Afford and Simon for the services they provided? Yes, there were. Um, you haven't attached any of those in full to your, your statement, is that correct? Oh, I'm pretty bad at keeping people. <laughs> but, yes, every year we would um, have a, a meeting and um, well, in 2016 NDIS came through. So we had a meeting with the LAC officer and would go through his wants and needs to be able to provide. And then once the funding came through, we would then get a service agreement sent home for us to sign and then send back. When you say LAC, local area coordinator? Yes, through NDFA, yeah. Yep. And you, as I understand it, Simon would attend those meetings with you? Yes, he yes. would. All right. And then you said Ford would send you a service agreement. We're talking from 2016 onwards. Actually, from 2014 onwards, he's, he's had a service agreement yearly. Yep. And would that would you be invited to afford to discuss that document or how was it provided to you, do you recall? Oh, no, it was sent home in his bag. All right. And then I would send it back in his bag. All right. Um, do you recall um, there, there, were, there was a quote part of those agreements of for their the costs of their services and their rates. Do you recall that? Yes. And I think you attach one of those, and I'll bring you to that in a moment, to your statement. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall any other details that were set out in that agreement? Oh, there was so much in that agreement that I didn't actually sit down and read it word for word. Did Afford encourage you to read it or offer to go through it with you? No, they were very quick, like, can you just sign it and send it back as quick as possible? All right. You can I ask you this: the the original centre was at Paul Street, correct? That's correct. And that changed in twenty twenty. Yes, while well, Simon was off because due to COVID. Due to COVID, um, how far from Paul Street were you living, or are you living? Uh, three point two kilometres. 
All right. And you used to drop him there and pick him up till 2016? That's correct. September 2016 was when I was injured and that was the last time that I actually drove him to and from. Um, <coughs> at that point, um, obviously, he didn't require transport from home or back to home. Was he getting personal care support from no. a Ford? No. Has he ever had personal care support at home from a Ford? No. Right. Was the team leader your main contact at at the centres? Yes, yes. Um, but I think you also had contact with the lifestyle assistants and the times you would drop him off and pick him up? Yeah, sometimes we would have a conversation when um, the lifestyle assistants were in the buses, if there was anything to be told or if he was going to be away or stuff like that. So, But, but those liaisons weren't structured in any way? They were ad hoc? No, no. Did a Ford offer or invite you to have meetings on a periodic basis? No, they didn't. Oh. Only for the NDIS, for the review. I see. All right. Um, when uh, Simon uh, started, the ratio of support, what was the ratio of support originally, do you recall? Uh, it was three to one because it was the same at school, at school. I see. Did that change over time? Yes, it did. I think it was 219. Uh, he was then put one to one. All right. And what prompted that, do you recall? Uh, the team leader was just uh, said to me that because there'd been a few behaviours, which was part of his plan to have behaviour support put on there, which was never given over the whole time that he actually attended a Ford because uh, they wouldn't let me use funding to get a private behaviour specialist. We had to go through the afford intake team and they yeah. kept, um, they'd sent me a, a letter out in the mail stating they had been trying to get hold of me for 12 months via email and phone and I refused to answer any of it, but I never received any email or any phone calls. And then when I finally did get through to the lady, she said she'd put him back on the bottom of the list. And this was an ongoing occurrence for the whole seven years he attended. So he never got any behaviour therapy, even though that was part of his funding. Through the NDIS? Yes. All right. So you, you took it upon yourself to get an external update and review. Is that right, eventually? That's correct. In 2020, I got a uh, support coordinator on board because I wanted to pull him out of a Ford after everything that had been going on and uh, we needed to get um, a behaviour because a lot of the different other services wouldn't take him on board without behaviour plan put in place and yes. it was knocked back by a few due to COVID as well. So that's when I decided that uh, maybe having somebody on board one-on-one -on -one with a backup support worker yes. would be the best way to go. So in summary then, the only behaviour support plan that Afford had was that which had been provided by you when he transitioned from school? That's correct, which was put in place back in 2013. All right. Um, one of the other issues that you had that became an increasingly an issue, wasn't it, that was your observations when you dropped him off and picked him up, so this is prior to 2016, that he wasn't being encouraged or being, even being allowed to use his augmentative and alternative communication devices, his AAC device, his iPad, for example. Was that your observation? Oh, absolutely. I'd already spoken to the team leader and said to her, you know, he uses an AAC device on his iPad and that's the way he, it, he likes to communicate and put sentences together because he can only string a couple of sentences, a couple of words together, uh, could he bring that in? And I was told that under no circumstances was I to send it in, that it wasn't fair on the other clients, that he had an iPad and they didn't, and what if it got broken or got lost? I see. Was that, was that uh, when he was at school, was, was a, there a different um, model in which school supported or encouraged him in terms of communication? Oh, absolutely. He used the AAC device at school. He yes. also had uh, what we call PECs, which are picture cards that we used to uh, and have a, we'd have a finish box. It was also done at home 
where he would have routines put up or he could go and choose the picture that he wanted, whether it was food, drink, toilet, uh, vice versa, plus the AAC device. So he would use those amongst through school and at home. Were PECs used at the day program, to your knowledge? Not that I know of. All right. Did you raise that with them? Yes, I did. I, and that was um, when in the first intake I'd spoken to the team leader and said, you know, I've, I've obviously I work at a school and uh, this is the way that uh, we encourage independence. It's a, uh, communication is the key to good behaviour as well. A lot of behaviours are caused because their needs and wants aren't met and that's due to uh, you not knowing what their needs and wants are because they can't communicate. And did that change? Did their position change following that? No, no, not at all. In terms of the activities that Simon did day to day, were you aware of what he was doing? Uh, he was supposed to be doing different things like bowling and music therapy and uh, drama and gardening. And uh, but as far as I know. He didn't participate in a lot. He usually used to stand in the corner when I went down to spy, just clapping, listening to music. Did you raise that with a forward, your concerns yes, in respect I of did. that? Yes, I did. Were those concerns generally around um, a failure to support him to build life skills and his capacity to be independent in summary? Well, they would say that he was non-compliant or he didn't want to do it or he was having behaviours. Um, Mr. Fogarty, what period are we talking about here? It yes. might, help, might help to be a little more Is specific. this? Uh, can I ask you whether this was this earlier on in the 2013-14 period? No, or, this was later on. Are we talking? I'm talking between 219 and 220. All right, right towards the end of yes. the time with the Ford. Thank you. Um, in your statement, you, you refer to, you describe... And is this 2019, 2020, Ford providing glorified babysitting? Yes, that's what I looked at it. I mean, I was trained professionally and I know a lot of the staff down there. None of them even held their certificate three, let alone medication and tube feeding certificates and all the other stuff that we had to learn through the department. They didn't have first aid uh, CPR training or anything like that. Uh, How do you know after- that, Lily? Uh, speaking to the to the uh, actually lifestyle assistants. All right. And what years are you talking? Can you be more specific? I'm talking about two two nineteen and two twenty. All right. I would I would always ask them questions when they pulled up in the bus. I started trying to work out what was going on, why Simon's behaviour was different, why I was getting phone calls off the music therapist saying that. Um, you know, his behaviour was a little bit agitated and his anxiety levels were very high and he wouldn't participate in music. So I would start questioning them when they picked him up and dropped him off. And music... Flip- sorry, Lily. Go ahead, Lily, if Go there's ahead, something Lily, else sorry. you want to say. No, that's fine, that's fine. Music, just for the context, music therapy was an activity that he did through the day program but provided by a, a music therapist, is that right? That's correct. Afford used to have a one-on-one, used to be one-on-one service in, on a Monday afternoon from 12 to 4, and they attended Nordoff Robbins at um, UWS University where he would do music therapy for an hour with a music therapist, which he absolutely and totally enjoyed. And uh, the music therapist had rung me after he'd uh, a few times and said that his behaviours and his agitation and his anxiety levels were through the roof. And I'm going to say that was when he was one-on-one with Daniel Namali. I see. So we're talking second half of 2019? Yes. And and 2020? (laughs) Yes, that's correct. Do you recall Simon um, receiving, was he given a choice around what activities he did? Did a forward offer? In the beginning, yes. yes. Uh, he was given choices um, from from 214 to probably the end of uh, me 218. Going into 219, I received um, in his bag 
an activity statement asking for me to fill out what Simon would like to do. And I rang the team leader and said, this is not up to me to choose what he wants to do. It should be up to him to choose. This is about choice and control. I should not be controlling him. I'm just his carer. It should be his decision on what activities he would like to do. So sit down and ask him what he would like to do. And do you know whether that was followed up by a forward? Not that I know of. All right. What about his support workers or the lifestyle assistants? Was there any choice around who he would be supported by, choice by him? No. No, not by him. Right. I know when he was off on... Um, in 2020, I, he was off from March until October and I had rung on numerous occasions and asked if I could have some support at home and they finally allowed me to have some support for music therapy via Zoom. Yes. And um, I asked them, to, I chose two of the support workers that I knew that Simon had a good rapport with and that I would be quite happy to have in my home. and. Uh, they would alternate on a Monday, those support workers. Um, but that was like later in, in 2020, in the late part of COVID. All right. I think you were transitioning him back September-ish. That... Yes, there was a new team leader that had come in and my support coordinator had worked with her and she rang me up and we had a bit of a meeting over the phone and then she came over and met Simon and we were integrating him back into it was the new centre at this stage. Yes. And, um, uh, yeah, so I went in with him for a couple of hours the first couple of times and then they were going to take him for a day one week and then two days the next week. Well, I went into the centre on the first day and I drove in and parked with Simon and locked the car because there was a lady hiding in the bushes with blood all over her. And there was a man in the park next to the Afford Centre um, that actually was screaming at this lady. And I realised that the methadone clinic was actually across the road from the park. So we stayed in the car until they moved away. And I went in and I said to them, do you realise that the methadone clinic is actually across the park? This is a bit dangerous having clients with disabilities. And uh, we went outside to talk quietly and there was a needle in the car park and as I walked around the car park there was quite a few needles in the car park at the new centre and I said to her this is a bit of safety and health risk here what if one of the clients picked up you don't know what people have got and actually hurt themselves and I actually spoke to her about it and uh, put in a complaint to uh, Wayne and never uh, Wayne, heard Wayne Adamson, Billy? Yep, and never heard anything back about it. Um, did you raise it as well with the CEO, the issue I of...? Think my, I think my support coordinator did. I actually had spoken to my support coordinator, and I think you do have a letter there from my support coordinator um, giving some of the reasons that I was pulling... Simon out of a Ford and they were part of the reasons that I was pulling him out due to concerns of uh, they have a duty of care and a risk of harm as, as an organisation to these clients and I feel that having needles in the car park and the methadone clinic next door was uh, not really looking at their duty of care and risk of harm. Yes. Just for the benefit, Lily, for a moment, I'll pause there. This is an email, um, a copy of the email that was sent by a support coordinator. It's behind hearing bundle A, tab 21. It's the last document, Lily, for your benefit that I was going to take you to. Mm -hmm. um, I might take it to you now and get, get that document up. It's dated 11 November 2020. And do you agree? Have you got it in front of you now, Lily? Yep. Last document ends in 0017 for your benefit. Yes. Seven. They seem to be stuck together here. All right, take your time. It should be a two page document. Yes, I do have it. 
just to, to be clear, it's, it's an email, do you agree, sent from your support coordinator to you, which she tells you is a copy of the email she sent to a forward. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, it's not actually the email. You weren't copied into the email she sent. This no, is she, yeah. yeah, she sent that to me, yeah. And by the 11th of November, had you withdrawn him from a forward? Yes, his, his actual NDIS plan had actually run out by the 11th. So um, I had removed him by that stage, yes. Um, and just looking at this document on the first page, there's some bullet points. Um, it refers to Simon not being able to work with the support workers that he were originally agreed upon. And is that is that the agreement post COVID, moving out of COVID that they said that they would appoint particular people to work with him? And yeah, they had uh, they had appointed um, uh, two staff that um, that Simon got on really well with, and then. When the new team leader came on, she turned around and said they were the second, I can't remember what they're called, second in charge, like senior, senior lifestyle assistants. They were both senior lifestyle assistants and she couldn't afford to have them out and that she would send me who she thought would benefit. And I told her that that was not good enough, that had it already been previously arranged and Simon was quite comfortable with that arrangement all right and the next bullet point talks about the hours expected to attend a forward and it, that those you understood were between nine and three the email reads however some days he's picked up after 9 a.m and dropped home before 3 p.m therefore he's not attending the six hours for the center-based program which is what is being charged was that that's something you'd correct. raised with the support coordinator that's correct um some mornings i remember having an appointment um for workers' compensation down at Parramatta at 10.30 and I rang them at 10 o'clock and said, I need to leave and I need to leave now. Where's the bus? Can I clarify, the, this is post-2016, the bus is picking him up? This was in probably 2019. All right. And I said to them, you know, I need to be in Parramatta in half an hour. It's like half an hour drive. So we ended up having to uh, drop him off at the centre because the bus didn't show up. Uh, often the bus would show up at five past, ten past two, and it's like you're supposed to be actually having Simon till four o'clock on a Monday and it's ten past two. Like what's going on? And, um, yeah, so it was hickety-pickety all over the place with pick up and drop off, and that started in 2019. Um, and it was very hard for me to book appointments and do what I was doing around the time because, you know, you've got apparently from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock you can arrange your life in between those hours. But when it, anywhere between half past 9 and 10 o'clock and anywhere between 2 o'clock and quarter to 3, he's being picked up and dropped off. It's very hard to organise different appointments and do what you need to do with life. And did that negatively impact Simon as well? That Absolutely, because he would be waiting for the bus. Right. And it's like and he would be standing at the door waiting for it to, to come and toot the horn and it's like I don't know if he's got an inbuilt radar of time but he sort of knew what time after he'd had, you know, been dressed and had breakfast and all yeah. his patients were given he would be at the door waiting for the bus and if you're standing at the door for an hour and a half waiting for a bus then the anxiety levels raise and behaviors raise and over the page lily just a couple more bullet points just to summarize what by november 2020 were the sorts of concerns that you had and were raised by the support coordinator on the next page you it's written, like most people with autism, structure and routine is vital, which you've been giving evidence about for Simon. However, this has not been considered with various changes implemented again. Is that in reference to the change of support people? Absolutely. They had so many different team leaders and so many different staff. You didn't know who was going to show up to pick him up. Were you or... notified if there was to be a change of team leader, were you told? No, never. How would you find never. out? If I rang to see what was going on or to put in a complaint or ask a question 
and you'd ring up and ask for the team leader by name, and they'd go, oh, no, that person's no longer here anymore. And I think you estimate, don't you, the number of team leaders over the, over the last couple of years? Yeah, there was nine. And is that 2019, 2020 or a longer period from your memory? Uh, from 20, that would have been, I think there was 10 from 2014 to 2020. Right. But from 2016 to 2020, there was nine different team leaders, but most of them were between 218 and 220. Right. The, the next bullet point I think you've referred to, you talk about the, the staff turnover being very high over the years and unfortunately more so a spike in recent times in 2020. You also, well, your support coordinator also refers to notice having been provided the week prior on the 6th of November that Simon will no longer be attending services. But what happened the next week? The bus showed up. And was Simon there when the bus showed up? Yes, which caused a massive meltdown in my household because he thought he was going. Yes. <coughs> and he wasn't. The last two bullet points refer to something you've already given evidence about. Firstly, the new site location is very close to a methadone clinic and there's constantly used needles in the car park. And then lastly, you this uh, support coordinator email refers to the site not having clear signage or known fire exits in case of an emergency. For example, if a, e.g., if a fire occurred in the kitchen at the front of the building, staff and participants do not have a suitable exit. And if there is an exit available, it's not known. Had you yes. expressed this last concern yourself with anyone at a Ford prior to this email from the support coordinator? I did speak to the team leader about it. Uh, as as I went down, I said to you when we integrated Simon back in that I was down there for a couple of hours. And um, as you walk into the centre, there was a double door and then there was a door next to it. Yes. And that's the kitchen was, which was enclosed. And it was just like one big room that they'd put a couple of walls up um, for other, like an office and a sensory room. And there was no exit signs. There was no other windows. There was no other doors. There was no um, fire extinguishers. And it's like, I know working with these clients that you've got clients in wheelchairs that are out in standing frames and walking frames or in bean bags or out of their chairs doing some activity and even... Um, clients with autism that are very hard for you to move. So if there was a fire in the kitchen, which is at the front where three doors are, how are these clients supposed to, to get out and how are they going to get them back into their wheelchairs and to safety? There was no way. I don't even think there was a sprinkler system on the roof either. Were you consulted at all before the move to Mount Street from Paul Street? Do you remember any, well, I'll take that back. Were you, were you told there was going to be a move in centres by a Ford? No, I wasn't because at that stage we were um, off with COVID. COVID. I see. I just got a um, text message uh, to say we have moved, I think it was a couple of months after COVID had started, if I want services to please contact them. All right. And just by way of uh, timeline, you kept Simon back because you were concerned about him being immunocompromised and you, you kept him back at home from March to September, roughly? Of yes, and I'd had enough at that stage uh, because back in 2019, in July 2019, I was going in to watch my goddaughter have a baby and it had been arranged for a fortnight prior with the team leader that they would take Simon from 9 o'clock till 4 o'clock because it was a C-section. And he was picked up that morning and I said to them, if there is an emergency, the C-section might be put back, so I'll contact you if anything goes wrong anyhow I rang and the c-section had been put back to after two o'clock and I spoke to uh the 
um, second in charge, the senior lifestyle assistant. And she was quite rude and told me that they were understaffed and it was just unlucky and that he would be home before 2.30 and tough luck if I missed the birth. So she hung up on me and then I rang the the girl who was driving the bus that afternoon and said, could you please put Simon last instead of dropping, because we were closest, instead of dropping him off first, could you drop him off at last so I can, you know, witness the birth? And she was in the centre at the, the time and the senior lifestyle assistant grabbed the phone off her and told me to F off and hung up. So I missed the birth of the baby and got in my car and drove home to be met by the bus with this senior lifestyle assistant who got out of the bus and slammed the the door and told me that I was not a very nice person, um, that they were very understaffed and she was very stressed out. And I turned around and I said to her, I'll never have a grandchild. That was my opportunity to watch the baby being born. I hope you miss the birth of your grandchild and see how you like it. Well, at that, she swore at me and told me she was going to report me and chased Simon and I to the front door, abusing us. And I just said that I'd report her and um, shut the door. Billy, this was just for context. This was July 2019. Does that sound right? That, that's correct. All right. And did you follow up a complaint in respect of this? I rang um, the team leader who was in transition at that moment. There was just a fill in at that time. And um, they told me to go to the district manager, which was Wayne. What is that, Adam- Wayne Adamson? The- yeah. And I rang him on the next morning and explained to him what had happened and all the rest of it. And um, he said that he would have a look into it. And then the next day I got a phone call from the new team leader that was taking over and they said they would look into it. And a week later I did ask them what was going on with the complaint And they said that they were dealing with it. And I said, well, I want proof that you're dealing with it. And there was no proof or evidence given. And then a few weeks later that um, the the lifestyle assistant that did the abusing was actually promoted. And then I rang and asked them why my complaint hadn't been heard. Who did you speak with then, do you recall? The... Team leader. Team leader still, yes. Yeah. And then I wrote another email in September to uh, Wayne Adamson, HR, um, someone on the board and Stephen Herald. And I received an email back from Stephen Herald stating that he would look into it and he would get back to me within a week and I'm still waiting for them to get back to me. Can I walk you through a couple of documents? Can I can I ask you to look at the second document ending 004, Lily? And for the Royal Commission, that's a document behind hearing bundle A, tab 17. You should see there, Lily, an email dated 10 October 2019. Yes. From, is that from you to Mr Adamson? That's correct. I sent one in July. I sent one in September and I sent one in October. All right. And this describes in here what... The, in summary, the... That was a different ins- incident. Um, it was to do with the same worker. Yes. Um, after I'd put that complaint in, we had an NDIS meeting with um, the LAC officer from Uniting. And that was at and the Afford site? At that's Ford correct. Road? And Simon was with me at that stage. Yes. And I've been told by Wayne Adamson and the team leader at the time that that particular... Um, lifestyle assistant would be nowhere near Simon at all while he was at a Ford. So we were sitting in the meeting and that lifestyle assistant came in to get some printing off the machine and Simon started getting a little agitated. Then she brought a client into the meeting and it's like, this is supposed to be a meeting here. 
um, to, to help my child get his wants and needs met. And Lily, and then, Lily, this, sorry, this meeting was on, it says the 9th, it was the day before this email, correct? The 9th of yes, October. Yes, the 9th so of October. So this is about four months after what had happened in the July. The initial, the front yes. Of your house. All right. Yeah, the initial. And um, she kept coming in and interrupting the meeting until I actually turned around and said, what the F are you doing in here? If this is the way you're doing it in front of me, what is actually going on in this centre? I've been told that you are nowhere near my child and that you have nothing to do with with him, but within this hour you have now come into this office, given him anxiety, stemmed his behaviours all within the hour. So I then wrote the letter the email to Wayne outlining yes. what had actually happened and never heard anything back from that either. I see. Can I can I pause for a moment? Going back to the July incident out the front of the house, Simon was was present when that it, that's that correct. Occurred. There was four other clients on the, the bus and another lifestyle assistant and Simon when she got very abusive on the driveway. Did you observe any impact on Simon following that? Oh, he's made up songs about her, how she's a B-I-T-C-H. All right. And the next day he had gone into the centre and, and hit her. All right. <coughs> Can I ask you to um, look at uh, the next document that is ending in 0001, Lily, and for the benefit of the... Royal Commission, that's behind the hearing bundle uh, A, tab 17. I'll withdraw that. Just one moment. Do you have that, Lily? Yes, I do. Hearing bundle A, tab 18, I'm sorry. Okay. This, this is an email I think you were referring to it a moment ago, date, dated 16 November 2019 to Stephen Herald, the CEO. Yeah, it starts with good afternoon, Stephen. Yeah. Um, and here you refer to a telephone complaint about a staff member on 25 mm -hmm. July 2019, to which you spoke to Wayne Adamson and a team leader at the time on the next day, 26th yes. of July. Right. Um, then the next paragraph, well, I'll withdraw that. You, you say you haven't received a response. You followed up in September and October and you feel that it is a serious matter that has not yet been de dealt prop with properly. No, I mean, if I ever spoke to a parent on a school site in that way, I would have been actually fired. Yes. I mean, it's not the way you form a rapport with parents. I mean, you're supposed to be accommodating and try and rectify the situation, not make the situation a lot worse and uh, using that sort of language. And, and, yes, I mean, I can understand that um, they had a big workload and, yes, I can understand uh, stress of working with uh, clients that have disabilities and that things don't always run smoothly and stuff like that. Been there, done that. Yes. Um, and, you know, but there is a way that you go about it professionally and obviously they're not only trained in, they're not trained cert, cert, you know, with certification, but they're not trained in how to conduct themselves with uh, the families and with clients either. In this email, you uh, copy in the uh, human resources manager. You also copy in uh, Ross Fowler. Who was he at the time, to your knowledge? He was on the board. All right. And then uh, also the NDIS commission, you copy them in. Yep. Did you receive a response from Mr Herald to this email? Ah, uh, no. All right. Oh, sorry, I do lie. He did say that he would get in contact with me within a week. Did he email you or call you or text he you? He emailed me and said that he would have a look into it and um, he would contact me within a week, which I never heard anything back. All right. Uh, I'd like to take you to uh, 
stepping back a little bit, but to document the first document, 0032 ending for you, Lily. Mm -hmm. This is a quote, a one-page part, I think, of a service agreement that you annex to your statement. That's behind hearing bundle A, tab 16. I have that. Um, do you recall what year this this quotation? This was this... two nineteen to two twenty. All right, um, and it's only one page. This document you've provided, correct? That's correct. Um, if you look at the first uh, row, um, the third column refers to will be transported to and from the lifestyle centre one to one. You see that? Yes, I do. Next column, frequency requested 10 hours per week times 48 weeks, so 480 hours. And he doesn't attend. He never attended 48 weeks per year. He only attended 40 weeks per year as I kept him home on every single school holiday to give him a break. I see. Um, was the centre always open and available for him throughout a year? Let's say, 29, let's say this year, 2019, 2020, from your memory? Uh, they shut down for a week in July every year and they shut down for two weeks during Christmas. All right. And then you say you you kept him at home for uh, school holidays? I used to keep him home 12 weeks a year. And we also extended the funding and gave me a little bit, well, it was supposed to give me a little bit more flexibility with funding, but Afford seemed to do the service agreement and then freeze all the funding so you couldn't actually use the funding for anything else other than what they had already quoted. Yeah, when you talk about freezing, was that something you referred to in your statement happened or was put to you during uh, the time you kept Simon at home during COVID? Is that right? Is that a particular example? That's correct. Uh, I wanted to source outside support to come into the house and we couldn't get into the funding into core funding and even when I um, got the support coordinator on board uh, in 2020 she found it very difficult and had to write back and forth to afford to unfreeze money to pay for support coordination to get a behavior specialist on board and do an assessment to go through with the uh the review, the next review. You raised the freezing of the NDIS funds with Wayne Adamson, didn't you? Yes, I did, and so did my coordinator. Do you recall what his response was? There was no response from Wayne. All right. So effectively, uh, my words, uh, Simon was locked in with the Ford for that period of time. His funds were frozen That's effectively. Correct. Well, that was what Although was told to you. That's what I was told to me. And then when the last team leader had come on not long before he left, I spoke to her about unfreezing funds and she automatically unfroze them within a couple of hours. And I'd also gotten a bill from the team leader prior for $1,600 for daily activity fees. And Simon used to have his daily activity fees centre paid out of his disability pension straight to afford. And I questioned the team leader at that stage that there was no way I owed $1,600. And it ended up being they owed me $1,600 and she wouldn't rectify the situation. And I had to wait for the next team leader to come on board to reimburse me that $1,600 of fees as well. So was this, and I'll, I'll get you to look at the document I was starting to go through with you. Mm -hmm. It might be a useful point of reference. You see the third row down and the second last one, not NDIS funded supports, first column. That's correct. The three, three uh, columns over, daily contribution fee to attend day program. Is that the fee you're talking about or a different one? That's correct, the $8 per day, which was centre paid out of Simon's uh, disability pension. And, was and I've also noticed it says here um, Simon will enjoy one-to-one -one on Saturday events and it was like 4800 He never, ever, ever attended Club Afford, ever. And you're referring there to the, the second, second, second column. Second yeah. Row. Right. Yeah. 
Um, and then the total, uh, you can see the total in the bottom right-hand corner, $64,177.04. Mm -hmm. All right. And you say this was 2019? That's correct. Was there ever a time where you were concerned about, well, let, I'll, I'll ask you about this. Th this figure here, this total figure, did that figure concern you with respect to what his NDIS funding was at the time? That's all. That was all his NDIS funding. Mr. Parker, at, it. at some stage, I think we might need the documentation because it's very difficult to follow up. This is in no way a reflection on Lily's evidence, but what we've got is a, a fragment of an agreement. Yes. There must have been an NI, NDIS plan approved beforehand that presumably was in the vicinity of 60 or 1,000. Perhaps it was different. But at some stage, and I'm not sure where we are with the documentation, I think it would be helpful to fit some of these uh, figures together, NDIS plan for each year, service agreements for each year, so that we can follow what has happened to the NDIS funding, how much the agreement was for, and then Lily's evidence can then, I think, operate, as it were, within a context. Yes. Um, I don't have all the services. No, no, it's not, it's not in any way a criticism of you. It's just lawyer-like. We like to have uh, documents in front of us so we can uh, look busy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and my bird laughed too. <laughs> Lily, um, I hear what the chair says, but uh, if I can perhaps assist the chair or certainly your recollection, it's not a document, as you just said. You don't have all of the documents from the time. But 2019, did you, at the time of this document, did you have a support coordinator assisting or was it yourself? No, it was just myself. All right. At that time, 2019, do you recall whether a Ford was provided with a copy of Simon's NDIS plan and funding? Yes, they were. All right. So you shared that document with them? Yes. Your well, recollection. They, they could sign into the portal and see... <clears throat> from their end, what was in everybody's funding pitch. In Simon's funding, you understood that, is that right? Yeah. All right. And then the following year, I think you've given some evidence, the support coordinator came on board to assist you and Simon. That's it, correct. All right. Uh, and I think you gave evidence that there were, they, they found difficulties in the invoicing and the billing, is that right, with... I never got an invoice. Only the only bill that I did get was for the sixteen hundred dollars for the daily activities, which they ended up owing me that money. And um, but I never got any any monthly statements like I do now through my plan manager, how the funding's being spent, where it was spent, when it was spent. And that's what you get now. Did you say with the through the support coordination? That's what I do, yeah, with the plan management and the support coordination. I get a breakdown every month of what's left in the funding, what's been spent, where it's been spent, how it's been spent. Before leaving this document, you just if the fourth column, um, ref, again, looking at the not NDIS funded support, says payable upon attendance to be invoiced monthly. You didn't receive any monthly invoices, is that what you're saying? Exactly. All right. Um, did the... You, gave, you give evidence in your statement around a um, transport fee, and I think, again, this document refers to it. I think you say it was roughly $50. Yeah, it works out to $48 and $14 per day. When did that it, change at all? Did, did that not that I can recall, not that I can recall at all. All right. Um. You gave some evidence earlier that the ratio of support for Simon was was three to one when he started, That's, and then it changed to one to one. Is that right? That's correct. In two nineteen, what prompted that change? Do you recall? The team leader wanted him to be one to one due to him having some behaviour difficulties, um, because there was one day that he had lost after the incident had happened with the lifestyle assistance, he had lost it and 
had thrown chairs around and thrown punches at staff members. And they rang me and told me to go and pick him up. And I said, no, you, you caused this situation. I have been asking for behaviour support to come on board and you're not providing it, so you deal with it. So they put him on a bus and brought him home. I see. The next NDIS fun, uh, plan, though, included one-to-one -one support that was requested and agreed to by the NDIA, is that right? That's correct, right, which I'm very good. thankful for now. How long did that process take? That is, from the time that you were asked uh, to, uh, in effect, organise one-to-one support, how, how long before the NDIA uh, amended the plan? Well, our meeting was in uh, October. I think it was about around the 6th of October and the plan ended on the 10th or the 11th of November and it was in the next plan that rolled over. So this is 2019, Lily? That's correct. And, so, did, and did the one-to-one -one support come in in November or did it come in earlier? It came in the November. Right. So there was a delay until you could get the approval from the NDIA, NDIA for the one-to-one -one support in the new plan that was operating from November. That's correct. And did Afford assist in the process of getting the NDIA plan amended or the new plan providing for additional support? They did. What did they do? I had a meeting with the LAC officer and the team leader and the team leader was the one that presented everything to the LAC officer stating that they needed one-on-one -on -one support. Right, thank you. And that material, did it include any incident reports to your knowledge? Not, I don't know. They had a meeting after I left. I see. Did you, did you ever request incident reports for Simon from a forward? No, I hadn't. All right. Um, in terms of the one-on-one -on -one support or ratio, did you observe that support at the centre when Simon was there? Not that I know of, that he had one-on-one -on -one support for on a Monday afternoon. He did from 12 to 4 when he went to music. Yes. That I know of, and I know that speaking to some of the lifestyle assistants, there was one-on-one -on -one support when they did go out into the community. But in the centre, there definitely wasn't one-on-one -on -one support. Why do you say that? There wasn't enough staff to client ratio. When you say centre, are you talking about Paul Street or...? Both or, the new centre and Paul is, Street. Is that based on the observations when you...? When I have gone down there, yeah. And so you... Sorry, you have gone down... You, you went down to the new centre on Mount Street... I was often called down to pick Simon up due to behaviours. I see. Can I ask you about uh, Mr Numa Lee? Um, he supported Simon in, in 2019 and some of 2020, transporting him uh, to and from his music therapy classes. Is that right? That's correct. Did uh, he have any other contact to your knowledge with Simon? Uh, not that I know of. I did ring a forward up to speak to them and they told me under privacy and confidentiality they weren't allowed to speak about it. Right. Uh, there was an incident that uh, Daniel had taken uh, um, Simon to uh, music therapy and I was sitting in the front lounge room waiting for him to be dropped off and the bus drove in to my driveway and I went to walk outside and the bus drove off and back around the street and 20 minutes later came back and I went out and I said, why did you drive out the driveway? Lily, just a step at a time, <coughs> when you, did you see who was in the bus when it first pulled up? Yeah, Simon and Daniel. Was there anyone else in the bus? No, there wasn't. All right, and the second time it pulled up, I think, did you say 20 minutes later? <laughs> There was only Simon and Daniel in the bus and I asked Daniel where they went and he said, uh, Simon said you weren't home and I said, so you didn't think to come and knock on the door? You didn't think to ring my number or ring your team leader to ring me to see if I was home? I said, I actually saw you pull up, then take off and I want to know where you'd been. And he said, oh, oh, 
we just went for a drive and then he drove off. Did you raise this with a Ford? With the team leader at the time. I rang her that afternoon and I said, I want an explanation of what happened and where they went. And that was never dealt with. There was also an I afternoon. Just, sorry, Lily, can I pause you for a moment? Do you remember, was that the second half of 2019 or was it into 2020? That, that, that it happened? was the second half of 2019. Sorry, and you're saying there was another incident? There was another incident in the beginning of 2020 where Simon came home and his eye was a little bit swollen and red. And the next morning he woke up and he had a black eye and I sent a photo of his black eye to the team leader and just wrote, please explain. And she said that she would ask around and get back in contact with me and... I tried to follow up a few times and I never got an answer and then she was no longer there. Um, you raised that, did you raise that uh, formally as well with a forward beyond that team leader? No, no. You raised it though with the NDIS Commission, didn't you? In a yes, I complaint. did. All right. And that... Uh, that complaint remains open to your knowledge? That's correct. All right. And can I just summarise, in that complaint, you, were, you included the reference to the unexplained black eye? That's correct. Concerns around the supports provided during the COVID-19 pandemic? That's correct. Um, lack of communication after Daniel Numali's abuse in 2020 and his criminal conviction? That's correct. And the safety of the New Day program site and the quality of services that a Ford provided. That's correct. So you formalised those in a complaint to the, the NDIS Commission? I did. And this was following, Simon had left a Ford by that time, hadn't he? That's correct, yeah. Did a Ford contact you about Mr Numa Lee and what had happened at any point? No, never. How did you find out about what had happened? Uh, one of the parents had put it on Facebook and my old work colleagues um, rang me and said to me, you need to see this. And then I actually Googled Daniel's name and watched it all unfold of his arrest. So you never received a call from a Ford? No. Uh, an email or newsletter? No. All right. Did you raise it with, I think you gave some evidence a moment ago that you... I raised it with the team leader and they said under privacy and confidentiality they weren't to discuss it. Right. Um, and and that's, that's the extent to which Affords ever communicated anything about it to you? That's correct. It tried to say you're obviously very concerned when that came to your attention. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, then finding out exactly what had happened was, yeah, it was a bit devastating and it's always in the back of your mind, did anything happen to my child? Yes. Um, you moved Simon or removed him, I should say, from a Ford in... Uh, November 2020. November 2020. What, in effect, was the, it, it would seem, it's my summary here, that, that concerns were, were rising for you. What was the last straw or what, what prompted you to finally withdraw him? The last straw was seeing the new site and having another team come on board. Yes. Uh, and we had been knocked back from Sunnyfield and Thorndale and Flintwood um, due to not having behaviour yes. uh, support plans and COVID. And uh, one of the lifestyle assistants that was coming on a Monday during COVID uh, to do music therapy with Simon I had approached her and said to her, um, if the next plan comes back with the one-on-one, -on -one, would you please work with Simon and uh, do the one-on-one -on -one with a backup support person? 
and that person said, well, we'll just see what happens. And then the plan did come through and I, I went to her and offered her that again and she ended up leaving a Ford and coming on board with Simon. All right. So the model now is one-on-one support? That's correct. What, what do you see as the benefits? There's a huge, huge benefit. They meet up with a group uh, a few days a week. Yeah. Uh, where Simon was just in the centre listening to music. Now he does aqua golf, he does movies, he does bowling. Uh, they go to Don Bosco. Um, they do cooking. Uh, he's actually doing sight words and colouring in and, um, you know, using his AAC device, his communications have come on board. We've got speech therapy on board. We've got behaviour therapy on board. Um, so there's a whole team working with Simon. His independence, independent skills are coming along a lot better. He's more confident out in the community. His anxiety levels aren't as high. His behaviours aren't as high, which also helps with his seizures as well. So he's come on leaps and bounds. His communication has come on leaps and bounds. He's starting to put like sentences together. He's actually wiping his own backside. Um, He's helping himself in the shower and helping him dress himself. Um, He's he's wanting to help cook in the kitchen. So um, he's just happy overall and a lot more balanced. So it's been a massive difference. And this is how he was at school and it's like he took all these steps forward from school and then took about 15 steps back where he wasn't even communicating with the forward and now he's flourishing again. So it's just a huge weight off the family shoulder as well, yes. knowing that he's happy and he's getting the, the care and the needs and his wants met as well as his medicals met as well mm-hmm. because his support workers come to, um, are involved with the speech therapy, they're involved with behaviour, they're involved with his neurologist, his neurosurgeon, his um, psychiatrist and his GP. So they're involved in everything within the family as well. So they know exactly what to do. Plus they're trained as a nurse. um, So they know exactly what to do and the care that Simon needs. And that one-to-one support's covered entirely by his funding, the NDIS funding? That's correct. Can I ask you, this as a final question, noting the time and the commissioners may have questions for you. Um, do you still, do you, do you consider that there's a place for day programs, congregate day programs? There's a lot to be looked at. They are, are trained to start with um, compared to what I was trained and all the different training sequences and we were forever in training. Um, learn to deal with behaviours, learn to understand them as an individual. Um, There's lots to, uh, yeah, one-on-one I found has just, he's exceeded all my expectations. And um, compared to what he was getting, it's a bit institutionalising, a day program. All right. Thank you, Lily. I'll hand over the commissioners to you, Chair. No worries. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, Lily, I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions of you, and I'll ask Commissioner Bennett first if she has any questions to ask you. Um, I've just got a few questions. First, to say thank you very much, Lily, for talking to us today, giving evidence. Um, In 2013-14, when Simon first went to afford, was that under the NDIS? No, it wasn't. It was through ADAC. Right. And so when did he then move to having an NDIS plan? In 2016. In 2016. And did you have, so was afforded any time the actual uh, support coordinator or the plan manager initially? They were, yes. They were. And did you? They were right up until I got a support coordinator. And you made the decision to separate from a Ford to have a separate independent support coordinator. Is that right? That's correct. Um, but could he have stayed with a Ford still or was that a conscious decision that you made to separate the roles? 
that was my choice because I felt that he wasn't getting his needs and wants met. And that was the same for your plan manager too. You then um, made a decision that those two roles should be separate from a forward. That's correct. Um, and and is, does that explain why in the very beginning you had n- no idea of the invoicing, the costs and what the charges were because they were both providing the service and managing the money? Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, that clarifies that for me. Um, one other I wanted to talk about, you were talking about the changes now, but in your submission on paragraph 38, even though you sort of said you were reluctant to make a change, you felt it was glorified babysitting. Is that right? That's correct. And that you observed at times in this funded program that a Ford was paid for, that you would see them watching the Wiggles, Thomas the Tank Engine or the Teletubbies. Is that right? That's correct. Um, At school, we try and teach age appropriation. So our early ed kids were allowed to watch the Wiggles and Thomas the Tank Engine because that was actually age appropriate. As they got older, they joined things like signing choir through school and stuff like that. And we used to do Justin Bieber. That was more age appropriate. And going into it to pick Simon up from after work, I would often see them on the whiteboard watching, these were 18-year-olds and upwards watching Thomas the Tank Engine and Teletubbies and the Wiggles, which is not very age-appropriate. you think that they would have something, some kind of music that they could dance to and sing to that was more age-appropriate. And I brought that up with the team leader that, um, and my son would often go, this is baby crap. Mm. And, and what was their response when you said that this was? Um, oh, the client likes it, so we'll let the client watch it. Thank you, Lily. I'll ask uh, Commissioner McEwen. Have any questions? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> uh, just a couple of things for me, Lily, and thank you uh, for me for your evidence. When you were first one was when you were talking to the Ford about whether you could, for example, bring or have Simon bring his own iPad so that he could use his AAC, and they said something along the line of it might get lost, it might get broken, is it fair to say that you were concerned that that would have an impact on his ability to be able to communicate and continue to, to develop his capacity? Oh, absolutely. I was actually quite livid that they wouldn't um, take responsibility for that because it is a way of giving them an ability, is it not? That was the way they communicated. Okay, thank you. And the second matter is when you were describing just for, uh, with Mr Fogarty about your current arrangement uh, with the current support worker or the support that he has, is it fair to say that the, the NDA's plan is now delivering what you wanted for Simon? Is that that a fair characterisation to say this this is exactly what should be happening and should have happened? Very much so. Very much so. Thank you. Thank you. Lily, between 2013, 2014, until the NDIS uh, came in as far as uh, you were concerned at least, What were the financial arrangements for Simon's uh, program at the daycare centre? Attic took care of that. So we had a yearly meeting. It started off, I think, at $24,000 per year. And it went on different levels from mild to moderate to severe to high, depending on what ratio of um, funding you would get. So that, the funding for that came, of course, from a different source than the NDIS, but that funding was specifically for the purpose of uh, his attendance at the, Simon's attendance at the daycare centre? That's correct. I see. The funding that uh, Simon now gets from the NDIS, is that 
significantly greater than it was when he, for his last year at a Ford? No, it's exactly the same. So the total amount of the package, if you like, has not increased, but the, in, as you've explained, the quality of the support that Simon receives is immeasurably better. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Chair, can I just, sorry, one more question? Yes, yes. Just yes. on the point that you made. So when Simon started, you said it was about $24,000. and Was that paid by the New South Wales government or? A, yes, it was. It was through ADDICT, which is right. Age, Home Care and Disability Services. So was that service when he was at a Ford at $64,000 the same You'd see it as the same level, but the price that had previously been charged or paid to afford was twenty four thousand. But when the NDIS came in, it was sixty four thousand. Is that? Yeah, it jumped in measure. Every year, it jumped on huge amounts to afford. And was there more? Was it better with that increase? No, it was still the same. Thank you. Um, you've said that in November 2019, uh, there was approval for an NDIS plan providing for one-to-one -one support. Mm -hmm. the, at that point, how were the charging arrangements organised? Was there a monthly bill and who did it come to and who paid it? From Afford, I mean. Afford looked after all his finances back then. It wasn't until you appointed a separate uh, coordinator that things changed. That's correct, in 2020. It wasn't until 2020. So it was a Ford that was actually, what, as you understood it, reimbursing themselves out of the plan funds to pay for the services they were providing. Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Lily, I'll just ask whether there are any other questions that may come from any of the representatives. I don't say that if they make a request, it'll be granted, but I'll just ask if anybody wishes to make an application. Nothing from a Ford. Thank you, Commissioner. Right. In that case, Lily, thank you very much indeed for coming to the Commission, or at least notionally coming to the Commission to give evidence. We're very grateful to you, and we're very grateful for you um, telling us Simon's story and we wish you and Simon all the best and we're very pleased to hear the evidence that you've given about uh, Simon's current uh, position. So thank you very much and our best wishes to you and Simon. Thank you very much as well. Thank you. How long are we allowed, uh, Mr Fogarty? <laughs> we need 15 minutes. Don't we? 15 minutes. All right. It is now uh, 2.50. We'll come back at 3.05 p.m. Oh. Thank you, Chair. The Royal Commission is adjourned until 3.05. The Royal Commission is now in session. Uh, Mr. Fogarty, just before we resume, I think there are a couple more appearances to be announced uh, from the State of New South Wales and the State of Victoria. So first I'll ask uh, for the State of New South Wales if there is an appearance. No, I've been misinformed. Or Victoria. Uh, Commissioners, uh, my name's Scott Chester and I'm appearing on behalf of the State of Victoria. I appreciate being able to do that now when I wasn't available this morning. Yes, thank you very much. I think, um, yes, I think there's an appearance for the State of New South Wales as well. Is that right? Uh, I think we've now been unmuted by the wrong commission. The Gail Furness and Trent Glover are appearing for the State of New South Wales instructed by the Councillors for Solace. Yes, thank you, Ms. Furness. We can see you on the screen.
Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Yes, Mr. Fogarty. Thank you, Chair. The next two witnesses and the last witnesses for today are Susie and Rob, uh, pseudonyms chair. They're the parents of Toby, uh, also a pseudonym. Uh, Susie has signed a statement dated 28 April 2022. That's at hearing bundle A, tab 26. And just for reference, um, in that statement, Susie refers to that statement being, in a sense, a combined statement from Susie and Rob, and Rob's here today to assist and give evidence if required. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Susie and Rob. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for coming to the Royal Commission to give uh, evidence uh, today. Uh, I will ask you, if you don't mind, to follow the instructions of my associate who will administer the oath to each of you. Thank you very much. I will read you the oath. At the end, can you please both say yes or I do? Do you swear by almighty God that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Rob. And now uh, I'll ask Mr Fogarty to ask you some questions. If at any time you want to have a break, just uh, let us know and that can be arranged. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susie and Rob, you've provided the Royal Commission with some photos of Toby um, for the benefit of the Royal Commission there behind hearing bundle A, tabs 20. 7 to 31. I'll just describe those. Um, he's the youngest of six boys. Uh, one of the photos shows is taken on a holiday in New Zealand where he was visiting his brother with yourselves. Was that that last year? Um, it's the one at um, standing in front of King Kong at Weta Workshop. No, that was two years ago, I think. Right. Yep. Um, and the second one is a photo of uh, Toby with, with you and Rob, I think, on the same trip. Then there's this behind tab 29, there's a photo of uh, Toby and his support worker uh, at a picnic. I think you describe, and this is the current support worker, one on one support worker, you describe as being like part of the family. Then uh, tabs 30 and 31, there's a photo of Toby dressed up as Harry Potter. And then the last photo I've referred to is him dressed up as Woody from Toy Story. Thank you for providing those. Um, can you describe, if one can only describe in words and very shortly, but describe Toby to the Royal Commission, first Susan and maybe Rob. Um, he's, uh, he's a little joker. Um, he's, he's a very amiable child. He uh, is loved by people that meet him. He's very funny and yeah. He likes to play the class clown and loves to play on his iPads all the time. Loves watching movies and getting out and being social with his brothers. And uh, he's got three dogs that he loves to cuddle and one of them sleeps with him. And like any 22 year old male, he's difficult to pull off the iPad and Netflix, etc. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, he lives at home with, with both of you and uh, your, uh, his primary carers. He lives with Down syndrome and intellectual disability. Yeah. And I think earlier in opening, um, Senior Council referred to him using a, a peg fee. Yeah. Um, how does he communicate? Uh, he uses some made up signs that he's made up himself. He uses some Auslan signs. He uses some words that people that know him will understand. Um, the wider community don't really understand what he's saying, but those closest to him will yes. get the gist of what he means. Does he use an iPad or other AAC? He devices? did for a while, but because he uses the iPad for recreation, he tends to not want to use it for communication. He would rather just watch YouTube and things like that on his iPad. So. That's it. And I've referred to his five big brothers. It's very close to them, I understand. Particularly the next one up is in New Zealand. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the, you're planning to go over and visit again later this year with him? Yeah, in about five weeks. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, can I ask you some questions about uh, his, his schooling? Because yeah. I understand um, he finished his HSC and it's one of, the, I think, probably one of the proudest moments for the whole family. Is that right? Yeah. Um, he went to a mainstream school in the, in the early years yes. and um, in a supported class for primary school. Yep. At high school, he went to a school for students with disability. Yes. And that's where he finished his, his 
finish his HSC year. Um, he enjoyed school? Um, I think so. He was happy enough to go every day. Uh, used to get a bit stroppy towards the end of term, but yeah, in general, I'd say he enjoyed school. And um, did you, was there communication between the family and school, between yourselves and that school? Yeah. The high school? Yeah. Um, um, we used to use a communication book that was filled out almost on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, there were always phone calls to let us know how he was going. So, yeah. And who would who would the contact be in the school? Uh, sometimes it was the principal, sometimes it was the deputy principal, yep. and other times it would be his class teacher. All right. Um, he graduated, I think, in 2018, or it was his last year? Yes, I think so, yeah. And, this, and that's, uh, he then transitioned to a day program yep. to a forward. What, what was the decision-making process to get for him to go to a forward a day program? Um, the school actually had um, some, a bus tour that took the carers of the children in years 11 and 12 around to different sites um, to view what was available for after school. Um, I went on two bus tours. We went and visited a Ford. We went and visited Peckys, um, Nado, uh, um, Thorndale, Sunnydale, um, to give us an idea of what there was out there. Yeah. Um, I think by that stage we knew that Toby was not going to be able to work, um, that he would be best suited for a day program. So that was what we were looking for. Yes. Um, and that just gave me an idea of what different sorts of companies were out there. And what services were you looking for ongoing for him? Um, well, we wanted him to be able to access the community, um, to be able to interact with peers his own age rather than just spending all day at home with mum and dad, yeah. um, in the hopes that, you know, his communication would improve, that his uh, lifestyle would improve. Yep. Yeah. Um, and was, do you, do you also, at the time, you also required um, personal care support, is that right? No, we used to take care of that ourselves. Right. Um, yeah, he still, my husband's just recently retired, so he sort of picked up that mantle. <laughs> um, yeah, we used to do most of that ourselves. So the, so the only services in the time, I think, from um, late 2018 to 2021 with the Ford was the day program services yes, correct. and transport and transport and he used to attend in the beginning he used to attend club of forward, club of forward. Yep. some if not every saturday yes all right um, um and was there a reason beyond those that you've just given in terms of him engaging with club of forward what was it was a saturday you dropped him at Mitchinbury. Uh, to start with, we uh, would meet at McDonald's at Minchinbury and then um, towards, like, later on, we would um, drop him at the head office at Minchinbury and they would leave from there. And your impression was Toby enjoyed the Club of Ford Addicts? He loved it, yep. yeah. And I'll, I'll come back to a couple of those, yep. uh, those occasions that he attended Club of Ford. Um, a Ford had service agreements with with you for the services that provided Toby. Yep. Uh, and as I said, it was from late 2018 that he engaged services of them. Yep. Uh, if I can ask for a document to be shown. Um, and that's sorry, that's behind hearing bundle A, tab 34, document ending in 0997. So the document should come up on the screen for you in a moment. I can ask uh, to 
go to the next page just to see the clause that says term, page two of 11, towards the bottom 3.1. This is a, an agreement only for six weeks. Do you see that? <laughs> Put your glasses on. No, I can't see it with all that. Mr. Yeah, uh, sorry, what's the status of this document? The version that I've got yep. doesn't seem to be signed or dated. Yeah, I can see. That's so, Chair. I'll, I'll ask about that document. I know these are mere formalities. No, they, and, and <laughs> Chair, you've raised... <laughs> Similar points with earlier witnesses. <laughs> you, this, you, you see on that second page, there's a term that says a term of six weeks. Yes. And this is from 9 October 2018 to 19 11 2018. Yes. And as the chair's pointed out, if you look at the back page of that document, the last page, I should say, which should be numbered 11 of 11, if not signed or dated. Do you agree? No. Probably, I agree. It's probably not, you not, do not. agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. No, it's not so. Do you recall? Do you recall a, a six-week agreement as the first agreement, service agreement you had for Toby with? Yeah, Ford? would be. All right. Um, do you recall um, that service agreement being provided to you by Ford? Yes. Um, when, when did you receive that or in what context did you receive it? Um, that was when we first went and decided that he had funding left over from being at school and because he had already turned 18, he was able to access Collar Ford straight away, which I was keen for him to do to get a feel of whether he was going to fit in at Mount Druitt Day program. Um, and he was also then going to transition one day a week in the last term of school before he would eventually start in the January. So I believe this was to cover that period while so, he was still at school. So 2018, is, as I said to you earlier, and yep. you gave evidence that was his HSC year, I yep. call it his yep. final year. So this is the part where he's doing some part-time transition. Part -time transition. Yeah. Yep. All right. And then 2019, he's there. How many days was he attending from... Uh, he was going five days a week. Five days a week. And Club of Ford, Ford most Saturdays. And Club of Ford started in October. He went in October 2018 as well? Yeah. All right. Um, is it the case that um, you met with a business development officer and team leader? I believe so, yes. With, in respect of the, the first this first service agreement? Is that your recollection? I can't remember whether it was... I'm pretty sure it was this one, yeah. All right. In following, he remained with a Ford until 2021. Mm -hmm. For the next, do you recall the next service agreement, the 2019? Next, the next service agreement would have been just before he started or at the time he started in January 2019. And with service agreements from your memory, uh, the ones that Toby had, back to back in terms of timing with the Ford. So one service agreement would follow another. I believe so, mm -hmm. yes. Right. Yeah. Um, do you recall on any of the occasions, well, withdraw that, on this first occasion, do you recall the business development officer or team leader discussing the terms of the service agreement with you? No. Do you recall at any stage a Ford discussing them with you? No. Offering to? No. Did you have a support coordinator? No. Right. Do you, at any time when Toby was at Ford? We, we, um, we accessed a support coordinator in 20, late 2020, um, but previous to that, he he didn't have a support coordinator. Um, can I ask you to uh, turn to page three of this document, page three of 11. 
Actually, I should ask you this first. When you can I can I ask you to look at this document? Is this document? It's not signed by you, but it, does it appear to be familiar and be the one that it's yes. a copy of? Yes. To the best of your recollection, yes. on page three of eleven, clause five point nine under cost and payment terms, you see that clause that says the participant agrees to be personally liable to afford for the cost of the services if the participant has overspent their NDIA funds. Yeah, I see. Uh, were you aware of that no. term at the time? No. All right. Was there ever a time where you were concerned that he, there would be an overspend of his, of Toby's NDIS Yes, funds? yes. Um, was that in 2019 or 2020, do you recall? Sorry, I've just got to get my years. Take now. your time. Um, I believe it was 2019, early 2019. All right. And is there any consequence of that concern that you had? Sorry. Did, well, I'll take that back. Did you raise your concerns with Afford about his funds being overspent? I approached a Ford when we spoke about him going from a one to three ratio to a one, one to one. All right. Um, and because his NDIS plan only covered one to three, I was extremely worried that his plan was going to run out early if they put him on one to one. Was that 2019 or the next year? That was, I think that was late 2019. All right. Um, wh why, what prompted the change to the ratio, do you recall? Yes, I do. He, the very first day that he attended uh, Club of Ford, which I think was around the end of October in 2018, um, he absconded from the group at Bondi and was lost for about an hour, which put up a few red flags. Then again in, I believe it was March, hmm. 2019, he was lost again um, doing work experience at Coles at Mount Druitt. And we had a meeting with the team leader and the district manager at the time, who I can't really recall his name. Um, this is in 2019, sorry. This so was in 2019. Is it just after the March 2019? Yes. And we spoke about the need for Toby to be one-on-one -on -one because of his absconding. And I also at that stage said he only has funding for one to three. Yes. How will that impact his funding? And we decided that we were then going to put in for a a review of his NDIS funds. Yes. But that was why he went from three to, to one. The absconding incident. The absconding. Did he have a behaviour support plan? No. Was one provided? No. All right. Did you talk with the Ford about a behaviour support plan? No. Did they talk with you about one? No. In any of the time he was there in those three years? No. When you say we decided uh, in terms of uh, approaching the NDIA for funding for one-to-one, -one. did uh, afford assist in that process? Yes, they did. How did they assist? Um, we had um, a letter team leader who I can't recall her name. It's okay. Um, she outlined that Toby needed to go from one to three to one to one because of the absconding. Um, I also asked for copies of the incident reports. Um, you asked to, to Ford for those? Yeah, I asked for Ford for those. Um, 
so that it could all be bundled together and sent in for a review of his NDIS funds. Because it wasn't the end of year review, was it? It wasn't no, November. Of no, year his, year. his review was due in November. Um, but by the time we got all the relevant information um, together, we were told by the NDIS that we couldn't uh, have the review because it was within three months of his plan expiring. So it was must have been September, October? Um, roughly around then. Right. Um, so I have gone back to a Ford and said, what should I do? Should we, you know, I, I know that he doesn't have the funding um, for one-to-one. -one. Should we look at reducing his days, his hours, so that his funding will last till the end of his plan? rather than use it all up now and then him not have any anything to do for four months or whatever it was. Yes. Um, and I was told, it's okay, don't worry. Because at the time were you you were you believed that the funds would run out. I knew the funds would you run knew out. They would run I out. knew they would run out. Yeah. Um, what were you able to keep an eye on the funds at that time? I'll hand over to Rob for that because... <laughs> no, it was extremely difficult to follow the invoicing. It was spasmodic and you just couldn't follow it. And there'd be a whole group of invoices come through at once. Yes. The plan manager would say, no, that's not allowed. And it was just all over the shop. When you say the plan manager from NDIA? No, no our, we, own, our, our own, own, our own yeah, plan, plan manager. manager. Yes. Right. So he would reject invoices, some he would approve. And we never saw them and we'd only get them through the plan manager. And so at this point, prior to having a support coordinator, you you were both doing that. You particularly, Rob, were doing the, the toing and froing. Yeah. So invoices and billings from a Ford weren't sent to you regularly, monthly? We never got them directly. They went straight to the plan manager. Right. And then trying to follow, piece together what weeks you'd been and you just couldn't follow it all. So the plan manager come to you with, with once those had come in? Oh, unfortunately, the plan manager really didn't <laughs> offer a lot. No, no, they didn't help much. Just log on his, onto his website and try and find it out yourself. Right. Um, is it a, a result of those concerns around funding that he was withdrawn from Club of Four? Did that happen? Yeah. When was that, Susie? Um, so pretty much. Yeah, I think he he went from going every week to maybe going once a month. And then later on when I knew that we weren't going to get his plan topped up before his new mm -hmm. one, I took him out altogether. Right, and did he return to Club of Ford after that? No. Uh, mm, don't think so. Remember. I don't think so because maybe every now and again, but I don't think so because we just didn't have the funding. Yeah. And from your impressions, he enjoyed Club of Ford? He did, yeah. Mm. Yeah, he did. Um, can I ask you to, uh, still with the document in front of you, which you understand, which your evidence is it appears to be a copy of that six week agreement, mm. page nine of 11, there's a table part of the quotation, it's the second part of the quote. quote. Let me know when you're on page nine of 11, Susan. Yeah. You see the bottom, uh, or the third and second last rows, one is non-NDIS chargeable item, and then under that, not NDIS funded. Yep. Uh, going, moving across on the first one, non-NDIS chargeable item. Does that appear, it refers to, on the, in the fourth column, uh, 0.78 cents per kilometre after 15 k's of travel. To be invoiced to the participant monthly was that a trans? Do, do you understand that, or do you understand that to be a transport? The second page, page nine of eleven. Mm -hmm. If you come down the first column, yeah. uh, second last entry, non NDIS chargeable yeah. item, and you move across, not NDIS funded, varies as per participant request. I'm moving across the columns. Yeah. Is that at 0 0.78, 0 0.78 cents per kilometre after 15 kilometres of travel and then to be invoiced to the participant monthly? Do you understand that to be the transport fee cost? Or is that something different or you don't know? 
I don't know. I was never invoiced. Monthly? I was never invoiced. All right. And then underneath that, an in, the second last row before you get to the total, which is the bottom row, not NDIS funded N slash A, daily contribution fee to attend day program, payable in advance, moving across, dependent upon program slash activities chosen, and then finally to be confirmed once programs have been chosen. Mm -hmm. Do you recall him being charged a daily contribution fee? No, I recall him being, not at first, no, later on, he was charged for daily activities depending on what he picked. Um, but at this stage, no, that right. wasn't until way later. Okay. Um, you say activities he picked. So was there some choice that he had in the activities he did in that three year period? Uh, yeah, I would probably pick it because he'd have no idea. I could I say to him, do you want to do this or want to do that? And yeah, no. Was, was and how did how did afford make that offer of activities um at first we didn't get any choice um then we used to receive uh like a menu um and we would pick what activity there might have been two or three act different activities during the per day like a week ahead yeah like basically like that and I would pick whether he'd want to do cooking or music or bowling, whatever it was, yes. add up the total, and then I would send the money in an envelope each week. Right. And so that's the activity fees you're talking about? That's the activity fees. Was this, uh, was it 2019 or 2020, 2020, do you recall that this was happening no. later in the piece? You can't recall. I don't recall when exactly it was, but I know it wasn't was probably six to eight months after he started. I see. And you say you put the money together. How did the money go to afford? Uh, it would go in an envelope and I would either hand it to whoever was driving the bus that day with yes. his name on it and the amount, or I would put it in his communication book and hope that somebody opened the communication book and found it. Right. Did you receive uh, receipts for that money? I received a receipt for the total amount of money most of the time, not for the individual activities. But not itemised? Not itemised, no. I'd like to ask you some questions about uh, the abuse, Mr. Numali, uh, the, the abuse of Toby by Mr. Numali. Please let me know if you, you, need, a, you need a break. Mm -hmm. um, that plus a response, I'm going to ask you about the response by Ford to your, you and your family, uh, and also some questions around your observations of the impact on Toby and also impact on yourselves. Um, when did you, you were contacted by a Ford in April 2020, were you? You were called by them? I'm not exactly sure of. Yeah, it was April. It was April. Is that right, Rob? Yeah. And what did, if you recall, what did that initial call, what did they say or ask? The initial call was to ask permission to pass our details on to the police who had requested them as they wanted to discuss something that had happened at the day program. That was all I knew. Um, I said, yes, that was fine to have our details passed on. And it was a day or so before I got a phone call from the police to tell us what had happened. Did, the, did you know the person from a Ford who called you? I, no, it was somebody from head office right. and I know it was a lady, but I don't recall her name. What was your, both of you, what, what was your reaction to that? Um, well, yeah, I was a bit worried because I didn't know I knew it wasn't because they'd lost him again. Um, so I knew it was something more... Serious. Serious, mm. thank you. More serious than that. Um, and I was extremely worried because I, she was not at liberty to give me any information if she, in fact, had any information at that stage. Didn't she told you that, did she, that call? Well, she didn't say. She just said that something had happened at the day program and the police wanted our... 
okay. contact details. All right, and then the police contact you, what did they? Um, it was probably the next afternoon, so yep. probably 24 hours later, to tell us that what had happened um, they couldn't give us specific details uh, because they hadn't finished going through the evidence that yes. they had. Um, then they rang us again, I think the following day to tell us that um, Daniel Newmalik was going to be arrested. Yeah. Um, and that they would talk to us in the following weeks um, to let us know exactly what had happened and to get a statement from us. All right. Um, it's the case that uh, Mr. Numerly was was charged in respect of um, filming Toby naked or semi-naked uh, in a public toilet over the top of a cubicle. That was Correct. one one of the charges. One. Uh, another was him being uh, Toby being filmed by Mr. Numerly naked in a swimming centre shower. To your I knowledge, think so, yes. And then also slapping Toby across the face to wake him up and that had been filmed by him. And those were matters that were charged by police, as you understood. All right. Yes. Um, Ford called you to get permission to pass your number on. Did you get a, any other contact from a Ford? Yeah, I believe um, Daniel Newmully was arrested on the Friday afternoon. And I believe it was the next sat it was Saturday morning I received a call from Stephen Herald. And he's a, he was the CEO at the time of the force. Yes, he was. What what did what do you recall about that conversation? Um, he said that um, he apologised that you know, uh, for that it had happened. I, I'm at that stage. I didn't know exactly what had happened, and I'm pretty sure he didn't know exactly what had happened. But we just knew that something serious happened. had happened. Uh, he told us that uh, if Toby or Rob or I or any of the family needed counselling that it would be provided, um, they were happy to, to provide that for us. Um, and when I questioned him on, you know, how Mr Newmarley could be employed by a forward, he told me that all the checks and balances were, they had done everything they could with uh, doing background checks, et cetera, et cetera. So it was basically, you know, we did all we could. All right. Well, that's you, what it felt like. To that's me. what it felt. And in your statement, you refer to the, that call, that response being pretty perfunctory. Mm -hmm. um, did he follow up with you at a later date? No. Uh, did any other forward officer no. follow up with you? No. Did um, you attended, oh, I will draw that. Um, so you were never offered an apology beyond what you described. I think he apologised and you gave, discussed what that meant. Um, what about compensation and offer of compensation no. to Toby? No. Uh, no refund of fees? No. Um, you attended the court proceedings? We it, attended the sentencing. The, the sentencing. We right. did, yeah. Did Afford offer any support for, for you? Or your family or uh, perspective? The one of the the team leader at the time was at the sentencing. Um, but there wasn't any offer of any counselling or anything. It was just, you know, she was, I guess, there to to be a support. All right. Did she approach you or you you heard? Um, yeah, she she was approached all the parents. She was sat with us on the day. Yeah. But that was the sentencing day? That was the sentencing day, yeah. All right. Um, you've given some evidence. I'd like to uh, refer back to Club of Ford and the first absconding incident, as you referred to it. It was his first day on the 20th of October, 2018, Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, you, you were contacted, weren't you, by... That is you, Susie, or was it you, Rob? Was you were called by one of the? I was called by the team leader. The team leader. Yeah, who had received a call from the lifestyle assistant to say that Toby was missing at Bondi Beach. And Bondi Beach. Yeah. 
and did, did he how did they find him well he was gone for about an hour and then while they were looking for him uh, he just wandered back up and rejoined the group so he obviously wasn't too far away because he can't navigate traffic or anything like that so he mustn't have been too far away yes he must have been able to see them could i ask uh, for a document to you you sorry which were that you um, emailed the team leader following this incident didn't you about what had happened yep if you uh, document behind hearing bundle a tab 35 i think this is a series of emails i'll ask you to have a look at susie In bundle A, tab 35. Oh, thank you. I'll also provide a park up. St starting at the bottom. Yeah. Um, so these are this is an email chain, I think three emails on the 31st of October 2018, shortly after this incident, yep. about 11 days. And you ask the team leader for an update on the incident at Bondi Beach last Saturday. Yep. Um, and then that, that team leader responds the same day, the in the morning, the next email up. Yep. Uh, and they inform you there's a HR investigation going on in regards to the incident that occurs. Yep. Uh, they reassure you that at no stage does it affect his placement uh, with a Ford, with Club Afford. And it says, we look forward to having Toby back tomorrow and hope he enjoyed Invictus Games. While we're still getting to know him, we would like to have him on a one to two ratio. So is this, this is the first time from your recollection they, they required a change from the three to Yeah, after the three first day. All right. Yeah. Did this, and then you're right, I should finish off the email above that, still that same day. Thanks for the information. Yes, that's fine. Um, I suppose that will impact his funding. Is that something I need to revise in the future? So this is an indication at that time you were worried about the change in ratio. <laughs> the very first day. Of Club Afford. Yes. And this is, he's still in year 12. It's yes. a transition phase. Um, do you recall whether that team leader or anyone else in Afford followed up with you about that? No. At that time? Or? No. No one followed up. Um, then you gave evidence, I think it was five months later in March 2019, he was at a supermarket doing work experience and that was one of the activities you could do yeah, through the day program. Yeah, that's right. um, and you, were you contacted by phone about that incident on that day or at a later yes, date? Yes, I was contacted that day by the then team leader who told me that Toby had been lost from work experience and that he had been found at Mount Joy Hospital. So she surmised that he had walked from Coles at Mount Druitt to Mount Druitt Hospital, which wouldn't have happened because he can't navigate the traffic. Um, and it's about, what did we say, 1.7 kilometres. Mm. Um, and he had been found, he was okay, just to reassure me that he was okay. So I got the phone call after he had been lost and refound. Same day or? Same day. Yep. Then later on in the afternoon, I received a phone call from a sergeant at Mount Jort Police Station. Yes. Who just wanted to check up that a Ford had let me know that Toby had gone missing and that he had been found in the middle of the main road outside the shopping centre, which was not the story I was told by the team leader. Um, so we just surmised that somebody had picked him up and taken him to Mount Druitt Police Station because he was standing in the middle of Luxford Road. Uh, and... You just gave some evidence. He doesn't have any road awareness, road safety awareness. No, no. What about stranger danger? No, 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 whatsoever. Fair to say you were putting it probably likely very upset, worried about what had happened that day. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. 
Um, did you, re you request an incident report? You gave evidence that yes. you required then for the change in circumstances of the yep. NDIA. Correct. But you received that some months later. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had to really chase it up, and I did, don't think we got it until maybe June, May, June. So it was quite a few weeks later. And again, it told a different story. The support worker who um, told the story on the report told again a different story to what I'd been told by the team leader and the police. So we still don't know what happened that day. For the, I won't take it in this document, um, but for the benefit of the Royal Commission, that incident report, you've attached that to your statement, correct? I have, yes. Is behind hearing bundle A, tab 39. And that, that's the written incident report you received about the 25 March 2019 incident, yes. which you say gives a different account still. Yeah. Uh, and then you also received at the same time yes. the, the incident report for the first day of Club of Ford. Yes. That document also behind hearing bundle A, tab 39, has on the front of client risk profile summary. Uh -huh. uh, are you familiar with that or would you like, how about, could that be brought up? Just the front page of that document, Green Bundle A, tab 39. Just that front page. I'm, I'm only going to ask you about the top two parts of this. So it's a client risk profile summary for Toby. Yep. Um, environmental and social underneath there's a stranger danger in it then underneath that are traffic roads yeah this was this document provided to you by a ford at the time they provided the incident reports no when, um, did, you, when did you receive yeah, this yeah it all came together yeah it all, this all came together had you seen that risk profile summary before that no all right and so the stranger danger says in terms of severity if you work your way along high likelihood likely it gives a risk category of one staff observations of the sources of information and then it says toby absconds and has no concept of stranger danger and then underneath that the traffic roads again uh, severity high likelihood likely at the same entries uh, the last one management strategy strategy Toby absconds and has no concept of road safety. Yeah. Um, at this time, um, was there, it says management strategy, were you consulted about any other strategy other than what's written in here at the time? Um, no, and putting him from one to two to one to one. Yeah, all right, that so was all. that was all you were, the suggested adjustments. And yeah. again, to be thorough, uh, there was no, behaviour support plan that you're aware of no. for Toby? No. In place. Excuse me one moment. Um, the main contact, was the main contact in terms of the centre and the day program, the team leader or team leaders? Yes. Uh, I think in your statement you referred to there being a turnover of team leaders. Yes. Um, can you hazard an estimate of? Uh, I could remember six. All right. Um, but, you know, it could have been more than that. I, I just. This is the two. To I three. just couldn't keep track. All right. So, yeah. Were you notified of changes? No. How would you find out? Um, if you, I used to take Toby into the centre on a Wednesday after speech therapy. And if I wanted to speak to the team leader, I would usually find out if it was the same one or a different one. All right. Um, did, were any, um, did you, were meetings offered with the fat with you? No. And Rob and the centre no. ever? Uh, what about newsletters or emails to you? Do any of those ever come from a forward to the day program? Uh, no, not really. Service user being your, your son? No. Uh, 
Um, were there ever any social events that families were invited to that you were aware of? Um, yeah, I, yes, I attended one. Um, we weren't able to attend um, others because they were at night and we just didn't have anybody to leave Toby with. Um, but yeah, I did attend one. And what, where, what, did, what was that? Um, I'm not, I think it was just a lunch. There were other um, carers from other day programs there. It wasn't just a Mount Druitt one. I, I think it was- Was it just a Ford or was it other? It was a Ford, yeah. but I think there were um, carers from different sites there. And where did, where was this event? Uh, I think it was, it was up at a restaurant at Penrith. And did Toby come with you? No, he was at day program, Rob right. was at work. Did, did you um, did you ever meet any senior, any, any I'll withdraw that, your contact was with the team leader? Yes. Did you have contact with the district manager? Um, I think you gave some evidence that you did, you can remember we, their name. We had contact with the district manager when we went in after one of these incidents. Um, and I recall that he had left and there was a new district manager had just started. Yes. Um, and he attended that lunch as well. Right. That you just spoke of. Yeah. All right. Was there a particular purpose for that lunch that you recall? No, I don't. Not that I can recall. Did you ever, other than Mr. Harold calling you on the one occasion, did you have contact with any other a Ford person outside of the day program, so an executive or a... No. Right. Was that ever something offered to you, if you recall? Or... No. Uh, you gave some evidence that there was a communications book for Toby yeah. and you've, um, in your statement, you've annexed I think May 2019 and October 29, some extracts of a communications book you still have. Yeah. Um, and he had one at school. Yes. What, 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 if any, differences did you observe between how the school did it and how Ford did it? Uh, well, the school was, um, we'd fill it in almost on a daily basis. Um, a Ford, maybe once, twice a week, depending on the lifestyle assistant he had during the day. Yes. Some lifestyle assistants filled it out regularly. Others wouldn't fill it out at all. So yeah. it just depended on which lifestyle assistant had looked after Toby on the day as to whether it was filled out or not. And some of the entries refer to a Ford staff, so they don't specify, is that right? They don't specify. That's right. They don't the exactly specify right. who it was. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think in your statement, you estimate that the completion rate was 60% of the time. Yeah, about that. Um, did, did the communication book live in Toby's backpack or how did it yes. come back and forth? It did, yeah. All right. Did you raise concerns about the communication book with them, with a Ford? No, I don't think so. All right. So a very different experience to the communication book that was used at school. Yes. Um, in your statement, on a, in a similar vein in terms of communication and knowing what was happening, you say we had no idea who we were handing Toby over to each day, um, what he was doing. Uh, moving to the quoting and invoicing systems uh, of Afford, and you've given some inf information about that. I think in your statement you refer to, and this is probably directed to you, Rob, um, or the plan manager's involvement, but the system being confusing and inconsistent. Very much so. Um, is one issue I think you identify in, in the statements, identify the timing of in, invoicing was irregular, was inconsistent. Um, secondly, is it fair to say it wasn't clear to either of you how the funding categories aligned with the services provided from time to time. Correct. Um, third, quote amounts for a period was sometimes more than the funding allocated for that period for Toby. Yes. Uh, and then as you've given evidence, you had to cut the club, cut his attendance at 
club afford is that the effect was that you would cut back that service uh, or ask the NDIA for more funding to keep up with what was being required. Um, you, would, you were charged a temporary transformation payment, a TTP, that's something that you refer to in the statement. Yes. Um, and what do you understand, Rob, perhaps, what do you understand that to be now? Well, it, at the time it came in, I think it was mentioned in the last service agreement, that never mentioned before in any previous service agreements. When you say the last one, would that have been for oh. 2021, yeah. 2020? Yeah. All right. And I, I didn't know what it was, or what it, so I, I Googled it. It was um, it's a temporary transition payment or transformation payment Yes. for a Ford to get their systems, I guess, up aligned to, to the new NDIS system. The NDIS has been in for since 2016, and I didn't think it was appropriate that they should still be charging it in 2021, even though they might be entitled to. The support coordinator took that up with, yes. with a forward, yeah. didn't she? Yeah. Um, querying why that was being yeah. charged. Do you because recall? We were, we were short on funding, so we were looking for ways to... To trim. Trim. All right. And do you recall what response she or you received from a forward about the TTP? No. I can't, can't recall. No, no, no response. All right. But in saying that, it was shortly after that that we withdrew Toby altogether. Yes, yeah, so this we're talking 2021. Mm. All right. Um, if you could be shown uh, another document, which uh, is behind H, uh, hearing bundle A, tab 53. Ask for a hard copy to be provided to you, Susie and Rob. Excuse me one moment, Commissioners. I think I've pulled up the wrong document. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yes, that's a correct document. Thank you. Um, on the first page, Rob and Susie, you see it's a, the, sub, the heading is a statement from a Ford. Yep. Uh, and then along the left-hand side, as you look at the itemised part, small writing, it seemed to be five months of dates from 10 November 2020 to 31 March 2021. And then if you work across those small figures there in the middle, there seems to be a total of $871. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall receiving this statement? Yes, I do. What was your reaction to this statement? I uh, nearly died when I saw $871. Why is that? Well, because um, I didn't want to have to pay $871 in a lump sum and I didn't understand why it went back for five months. Why weren't we being billed monthly for the activities that Toby was supposedly doing? Um, and so you understood this to be that, that those activities fees you were talking about? Yeah, correct. All right. And so this appears, from your recollection, this was a document that was sent with five months worth of those fees. Yeah. Um, and this, this was when a, a new team leader had started. So I presume she was going back through and seeing that these hadn't been charged, so she was issuing everybody with a statement. And I should say that it's to March 2021, so this is his final yep. towards the end of his time with them. Um, did you go back to afford about this document? I actually rang the team leader and yep. I said, look, you know, $871, I can't afford to pay that. Um, I'd like to pay it off. So I deposited a hundred dollars into an account and I again spoke with her and said I've put money into into an account I'm not sure if it's 
you know, I've got no uh, receipt or anything from anybody to say that it's been received. Can you check up on it before I pay any more? No. I never heard anything back from her, so I didn't pay any more because I was waiting to make sure that the money was going to where it was meant to. Right. Mr. Uh, Fogarty, I noticed at the top it says page 34 of 57. I'll yes. leave you uh, to work out in due course whether there's any significance in the pedronation. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of this $871 fee, mm. were you ever provided with another document that itemised the activity? No. On the next page, you see it's page one of one in the top right, and it's a tax invoice, what's termed a tax invoice from a four day program for $164. Uh, this isn't itemised either in terms of the activities. No. Did you receive a, an activity by activity itemised document to support this? No. Um, the date of issue says, if you look uh, just above, give you the Mount Druid Activities fees, 1 April 2021 to 30 April 2021. It says date 5 March 2021, and then due date 15 March 2021 in a little box. So you can see that. I'm looking at, sorry. I'm sorry. looking at the tax invoice, the top. Yep. Of the page should have the number 1188 top right corner. So that's the Royal No, I don't have that one, sorry. Should be the second page. No. Let's check. Mr. Pogarty. Oh, it's fascinating as sorry. this is. I think we Thank you, pardon. may have got the point. Uh, if you would indulge me, Chair, just for a moment with respect to this particular. I'll indulge you just for a moment, Mr. Pogarty. Yes, I Let me it. cut to the chase. Yep. In April 2021, uh, you both of you with Toby were in New Zealand visiting his next brother up, correct? Correct. Um, you'd advised a forward that you were doing that in an email before, correct? correct? Yeah. Uh, you then, in June, I think, received this invoice. Correct. For activity fees in April when, in fact, Toby was not even in the country, is that correct? It was actually in May and yeah, correct. You were away for about two months, I think, eight we weeks. We were away for eight weeks. All right, so did that surprise you you were being charged activity fees when he wasn't there? Uh, yes. All right, thank you, Chair. Can I, the last document I want to uh, ask you some questions about is not, is the document behind uh, Hearing bundle D tab 25, it's an afford document. I'll just ask for a copy to be provided to you. And it's only the front page, one of 13, that I want to ask you about only briefly. The next document, it should have policy and procedure, abuse and neglect. not the document on screen at present. Which, which tab are you referring uh, to? Tab 25 of hearing bundle D. D. D for it. You've got that document in front of you. It's yep. just the one page and you, you see, Sorry, I'll wait for the chair and commissioners. The same document, commissioners, I showed to Sally this morning. The middle of, of that one, that page, you see a 4.0 policy. See that, Susie and Rob? Yep. 4.2 says it's expected that everyone who is associated with Afford and is involved in providing services to Afford clients will share Afford's commitment to maintaining an organisational culture that, um, before I proceed in abundant caution, the document at the bottom says date approved 12 March 2020. 
from that time on until 2021 when Toby finished up with a Ford, was it your experience that, uh, as is suggested in 4.2.1, ought to be the case that um, the organisation or culture at a Ford upheld the values and dignity of its clients? Is that your experience? Mm -hmm. 4.2.2 builds trusting relationships with afford clients, families, advocates, and carers. Was that your experience? Mm -hmm. Underneath that, 4.2.3 provides services in an, in an environment that is safe and welcoming for everyone. Was that your experience? 4.2.4 mm -hmm. empowers clients by helping them to understand their rights, mm -hmm. up to your knowledge. 4.2.5 ensures everyone feels safe to raise concerns. Can you, was that your, your experience? No. And lastly, if, underneath if you that. wouldn't mind, if, if just uh, use a word to answer because we need to transcribe the answer in the transcript. Thank you. Is that your experience? No. And then lastly, 4.2.6 responds proactively to concerns when they arise. No. Or, um, is it fair to say that? Um, Mid-June, you received a tax invoice uh, that raises similar concerns that you're referring to, I think Rob in particular, that was essentially the last straw for you to, to take Toby from uh, a Ford. And today he receives one-to-one -one support. Uh, yes. And is that all covered under his NDIS funding? Yes, it is. Has his funding had to increase between being at a Ford to this new model, as I call it? Do you no, know? it hasn't. It hasn't, hasn't had to increase, no. Right, does it remain the same to your knowledge? The actual hourly rate has gone down. All right. Um, what are the benefits or pluses of this new model? Um, we have a lot more uh, choice. We have a lot more control over what Toby does. Um, we have a lot more communication with his carer. He gets to pick what he wants to do on the day. Um, he still joins up with another group of carers and people with disability on a daily basis and they all go and do activities together. If Toby doesn't want to join in that activity, then his care worker will take him to do something else. Yep. So it's all about him and not, it's all about fitting in with him and not him fitting in with and Rob, what about the billing and the invoicing? Oh, it's much easier. She sends us an invoice every yes. week, copies the, sends it to the, the plan manager, and then we get a copy as well. All right. She lists out our hours for every day she spends with him. And do you have a do you have a written communications book or an oral one? I uh, know we speak to her every afternoon and every yeah. morning. Right. So. Um, my, my last question is in terms of uh, the afford, well, the day program, the congregate setting. Do you think there's still a place for Susie for such a service? I do, but I think that it doesn't suit every person with a disability. I think that people like Toby and the other people with disabilities that we've heard about today, I, I think they need more than a day program can give them. I think there needs to be a lot more consistency with the day program. The day programs seem to be cookie cutter. Yeah, you know, all exactly the same. Whereas a lot of clients need their own version. You know, they need something different. They need something more than a floor. And Rob? I, I really think that the team leader role is just <laughs> too big for one person. Right. It is, I, I'd hate to do that job. It's horrendous. They're the human resources manager. They've got to deal with the clients and their families. They've got to deal with the staffing rosters. Um, the, what else? They're the operations manager, working out what, what activities are going to be done during the day. They've um, got to look after the medical needs of the of the clients. 
Uh, yeah, they're the, I guess the accounts receivable, accounts payable, and financial controller reporting up to head office. And then on top of that, they've got all the regulatory overview of the Disability Act. It's for one person that is horrendous. There needs to be more support. Thank you, uh, Susie and Rob. That ends my questions. Chair. Thank you very much. If it's okay with you, I'll ask my colleagues if they Not have sure. any questions. I'll ask Commissioner McEwen first. And thank you. Uh, one quick question for me. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for your evidence. So is it fair to say or characterise the current arrangement with, and with the NDIS package is meeting what you want for, yes. for Toby? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Ben. Um, you spoke with pride. Um, about Toby finishing his HSC. Yes. Um, and you talked about the work experience that he'd had at Coles. Yes. Did he enjoy that? I think he did, um, because it was for a very short mm -hmm. period of time, because uh, his concentration's not very good. Mm -hmm. But yes, I think he did enjoy it. So two questions I have. Do you feel that there was more choices for Toby when he left school, maybe further training or something that could have helped him rather than a, a day program? I personally don't think so. Um, he's got a very limited attention span to start with, doesn't take follow audit, like follow instructions very well. Um, and I just don't think he has the mental capacity to hold down any sort of work. But the day program wasn't right. That's for him. He needed more. Is that what you were saying? He he needs. I think he needs more care than the day program could provide him with. Um, I think that. There's not enough staff to provide the one on one that a lot of these clients need. So, do you feel his skills, his independent or capacity building went backwards and now it's moved? Um, yes, progressed? I do. I, yeah, I do. So, the day program you felt didn't give him that experiences? Um, for that journey of independence that you refer to yeah, in your submission program, and you're finding the new arrangements do give. Yeah, the day program seems to be uh, fitting in with the group, uh, with what the group activity is on that day. If it's not something that interests Toby and there's not enough, um, not enough variety, there's not enough carers to take him and do something that he wants to do. Yeah. I think this, what he has now is giving him a bit more independence on making his own decisions of what he wants to do. So it's building his capacity. Yeah, mm. rather than him just fitting in with the group. He'll go shopping now with his care and he'll pay for stuff himself, tap and go, and mm. he's learning how to do that and yeah. he buys what he wants. So do you feel he went a bit backwards in that skill capacity since leaving uh, school? I wouldn't say that he went backwards, but I certainly wouldn't say he moved forward. That's fair. Thank you both very much. In your uh, statement at paragraph 78, you, you refer to engaging plan managers in December 2018. What prompted you to do that? I didn't really want to have to deal with that myself. And we went to like an information day at the school and they had plan managers there. They explained what plan managers do. And I just thought that would be one less thing I have to worry about. They, they could take care of all the bills, speech therapy, et cetera. And that was why we decided to go with a plan manager rather than an agency manager or do it ourselves. Right. 
did you find that helpful? Yes and no. Yes, because we didn't have the added responsibility of wading through the bills and paying them ourselves, but we also didn't know exactly where all the funds were going. There was a bit of control. Yeah. And then a little later, in fact, well, in November 2020, uh, you were introduced to a support coordinator. You refer to this as paragraph 85. Mm -hmm. Again, what, what prompted that change? We were looking to try and get extra support from the NDIS and another lifestyle assistant said that other families had benefited from having a support coordinator help them. So we decided that we would engage um, the support coordinator to try and help boost Toby's funding because we knew we weren't going to have enough for 12 months with the board. And as a result of that, if I follow what you've said in the statement correctly, there was an extra $15,000 provided through the NDIA. Correct, but it still wasn't going to be enough no. for, for Toby to attend the board for 12 months. So that was another reason why we made the decision to find our own support worker. In that paragraph, you added in parentheses who was not the support coordinator, who was not part of a forward. No, the support coordinator yeah. was not part I of I understand. Forward. I'm just wondering why you put that in. Um, because the lifestyle assistant who put us in contact with her wasn't a forward lifestyle assistant. So I, I just wanted to, to make sure that we didn't think that it was you know, jobs for the boys. Good, thank you. I understand. Thank you very much. I'm just going to check if uh, there's anyone else who will seek to ask you questions. I suspect not, unless someone leaps up and says they do. Thank you very much. In that case, thank you so much for uh, coming to us today to give evidence, Susie and Rob, and telling us about uh, Toby and his story and your story. We're really very grateful to you and also for the information and insights you've given us. They're very helpful. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mr. Griffin, you're about to say something. Can I indicate, um, Chair and Commissioners, that we're starting at 12 o'clock tomorrow. Yes. From 12 to 1.30, we'll have the evidence from Diane. Then there'll be a 15 minute break and we'll have evidence from Erin from 1.45 to 2.45, followed by another 15 minute break and then the evidence of Samantha Taylor through to about 4.15. One of the reasons I say that is if people fancy having lunch, they should have lunch before 12. Yes, yes thank you. I should say that this is entirely my responsibility. We're starting at 12 to something that uh, I regret is unavoidable, um, but we will start at 12. The other thing is that has been brought to my attention that uh, instead of day program, I, programs, I said from time to time, daycare centres. As Mr Fogarty will know, this is an example of parapraxis, which is dealt with in Sigmund Freud's introductory lectures to psychoanalysis, lectures two and three. So that's an example of parapraxis that uh, Mr Fogarty will explain to all other people at the bar table. We'll uh, resume then at 12 noon tomorrow. The Royal Commission is adjourned.